All right, I just went live too. So I think I probably have to close. I'm live, baby. Lots of things. <laughs> probably going to hear myself talking in two seconds, but. Oh, yeah, I got um, Cool. All right. Hey, everybody. So I think we are live now. Looks like there's a lot of people on here with Charles as soon as Charles talks. Hey, guys. Hopefully, I'll pop up soon. What's going on? So one day I will figure out how to do this uh, side by side streaming stuff so we can <laughs> actually show up side by side in Zoom. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of desktop sharing today, though, so it probably won't matter too much. But the plan today was to well, do a couple things. First, answer a bunch of questions. If you guys have questions just about general Unity stuff, game development stuff that we can answer. And then um, we're going to build out a little game. So take a mobile game, build a clone of it, go from a completely empty project. We'll go through the process of throwing it together, building it, show all the kind of problems and issues that come up and the things we stumble with. And then after it's done, we'll do another version of it where it's like the nice, completely edited, clean version. So kind of like what you normally see in a YouTube tutorial. And then right now we're going to do the live behind the scenes version of it first. So you can see that all, see it all kind of come together. And um, yeah, know that it's not always just magic, right? It's not just like you do it and you always know the right thing. The first thing that you do works perfect. So that won't be what you'll see today, but we'll be taking questions and stuff. And then, um, like I said, the full version or the edited version will be available. So if you just want to do the step-by-step -step and not see all of the problems, you'll be able to do that as well. Anyway, I think, Charles, you're live streaming um, too, right? Yes, so I am. If you're on my channel watching, make sure you subscribe to Charles' stuff. He's got lots of great content there. Um, and before we get going, if you don't mind just hitting the like button and the share and all that stuff, it does help just get more people in here and let more people see what's going on and hopefully make people better game developers. Sorry, I'm like looking off to the side, but that's where all my chat is. It's kind of <laughs> over there. Um, oh, and there's my knight. He's almost ready, by the way. So let's see. Um, you want to kick off with questions, dude, or? Um, sure. I mean, I don't see if see we have a couple questions real quick, maybe do like five minutes of questions and then we'll get into actually building the game. Sure. Uh, I see a question on your side. Oh, look, someone says, can you link Charles's channel? Let me do that. I I'll think try. Charles can do that right now. I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first question I'm going to answer. Yes, I can. And then somebody asked about using, um, scriptable objects as humble objects. Have you done that before? Um, I have not run into that use case so i'm trying to figure out how to how to link this but um using scriptable objects as humble objects no but i mean i don't see why you couldn't yeah i haven't done it myself either so i'm kind of curious um what that would look like I, I have a couple ideas but i have a feeling i'm picturing it wrong in my head <laughs> i mean i don't know it's kind of a weird way to i guess word it you know like you could have like they're almost like they're mutually exclusive ideas like you could just you could have a scriptable object and you know if you delegate enough to it and run unit tests or write unit tests for the scriptable object then i guess technically it's the humble object pattern yeah i guess i think you're right i'm just not sure what the what the use is i think you're probably in the same boat though. <laughs> i <kind of> forgot <laughs> exactly what the use case is um i don't see let's see a couple other questions so never mind going over ability effect system like you could find in an rpg um i would definitely love to do that i built a bunch of them um they're really complicated though. So it's yeah. something I, I don't think I do in a live stream, but I might make a video on that just, um, and the whole idea is like making a system so that you can build out abilities or combat things that have multiple different effects and lots of things going on. It doesn't make sense for most games, to be honest. Like if you're building you know, a first person shooter or a strategy game or basically anything that's not like a fantasy RPG with tons and tons of spells i don't think it makes a lot of sense but if you're building something like that you need a, a really complex system for that so that you can kind of combine and create all that data and have it control your game um but yeah i'll definitely do that i'll do like a super complicated one i think it'd be fun and i've built yeah, many of them in the past and it's been a lot of fun gotten a lot better at it so i think I, i'd love to do that i always find that those types of things are kind of hard to run a tutorial for or create a tutorial for because there really are specific to the game you know like even like even as something as simple you would think as an inventory maybe simple is the wrong word something that you think could be genericized like an inventory system um 
it's it's like i mean the inventory system for world of warcraft is dramatically different from the inventory system for something like minecraft you know you know conceptually it's like yeah i get an item i put it in my bag but you know how do you represent items do, are those items equipable are they you know usable are they there's just so many different things that it's very hard to create one tutorial uh for all cases by the way someone was mentioning that my like my microphone was low i turned it up let me know in the chat if i need to keep raising the volume yeah i think you're totally right on that too like the inventory systems i've been trying to build some something similar recently and getting it super generic i think is it's almost futile right? <laughs> like it's it's not gonna work in your game generic you're gonna need to customize it so yeah, having a generic system to start can be okay, but it's usually going to, I think, shove you into problems. But it's a good thing to learn how to build and I think build a couple of them and see what it's like and see what the problems are. So like you said, they, they come out totally different. You could have slots with slot numbers. You could have space and slot size where they take up you know a certain amount of area in a bag and you have to arrange them. Um, Stacking. Limited inventory is like yeah, things like that. I'm actually building, and that's why I brought it up because I'm building an inventory right now, specifically using um, the whole scriptable object workflow that um, Ryan Hipple, you know, that famous Ryan Hipple talk. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm building one now and I'm like using only that workflow, you know, scriptable objects, uh, you know, value objects and uh, like game events, the way he uses them, uh, runtime okay. collections. It's really cool. But, and it's kind of like, again, and mutually exclusive, like, um, the type of inventory I'm building, I just happen to be modeling it after World of Warcraft because I've put hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours into that game. So I know that inventory inside and out. Um, but then I was thinking like, well, you know, some of the problems I'm trying to solve for this probably don't even come up in a bunch of other games. Yeah, they don't in most games. Are they? Yeah, definitely in most games. Yeah. Cool. You have to share that when you're done with it, dude. Is yeah, it for a project or? That's yeah, for fun. I could, I mean, maybe if we get some time, I can pull it up. Yeah, that would be cool. I think that'd be a fun, a fun use time. People might be interested. If you guys are interested in seeing that, um, just mention in the comments, we can jump to it quicker. Um, somebody else asked, do you have good uses for partial classes in Unity? Um, no, not really. I think partial classes are the devil. <laughs> they're, they're evil. They were, they were created for the a sole intention of making wind forms hackable with like with designers so the designer code could create stuff and not break your code um partial classes really just hide big classes it's really just a way to take a big giant class and pretend that it's not big i mean it does i'll, I'll be honest it does make it a little bit easier because you can segment your code a tiny bit but it's worse than just using regions i think because it, it really hides the complexity and it hides how big things are. It also makes it really hard to know why something is working that you're not expecting to work because you can't find it in the class. And then you find out that there's this little partial declaration of it somewhere else that's handling that one little part or something. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the only use case personally that I've ever found it, um, that I've ever found it acceptable is when you have some part of your a framework or engine you're using generating code and you want to be able to edit that class that it generates, um, you know, in a safe way because generated classes obviously will get regenerated over on, on and you'll lose you'll lose anything you edit. So, yeah, and I think WinForms is like that's the scenario. It generates a WinForms class. You can edit the partial, and it can keep generating over and over as you edit the UI, but you won't affect your your proprietary code. Yeah, it just it tends to be a mess. It's much better if you can keep the file small. Like if you get to the point where you're thinking, Hey, I want to make these partial. It's there. There are definitely better options and things that you could do. You could look at just ways to refactor and separate that out. Think about how these could actually be separate classes because that class is probably doing way too much. It's probably a little overcomplicated. Um, let's see. What other things do we have? Can we learn to publish a game on Google play step-by-step? Step? Um, I'm not sure where a good place for that is now been a little while since i published a game out on google play i don't know if you've got any advice on that so. no, i i do not I've, i haven't really um messed around with that to be honest it was pretty straightforward though just going through the um google i think i just used google stocks last time just stepping through them it wasn't anything too complicated you build out the apk um submit it with all the metadata the hardest part for me i think was getting the art 
in the right sizes yeah because i'm not an artist (laughs) um but yeah they have i think they had pretty good documentation on it it was a lot harder getting on ios just the documentation and the steps were kind of a pain but i think that that's probably that must have changed by now i always find with those things that it's like you'll learn it and then when's the next time you publish a game you know (laughs) maybe a year if you're lucky you know if you're really or all right maybe a couple months if you're really working hard and by that time things have changed you know there's certain pain points that are always going to be pain points i just i just my suggestion would be if you're ready to publish the game you know start doing the research and figuring out what makes sense for you you know i think jason in my chat said there was a udemy course or skillshare courses but uh yeah it's, it's just not something that unless you work for a company and that's your job like like having that knowledge it's like on it's like a one-off yeah it's not something you do often it's just like steam deploying like i used to remember that you know back of my hand but i haven't pushed out a building to steam in a while so i don't remember anymore <laughs> but it's <laughs> yeah. easy to go back and learn yeah right, um let's see a couple other questions and we'll get on to building the game so let's see um hi is c-sharp good for input handling in building games like sims and plan or c-sharp events good for input handling in games like Sims or Planet Coaster. Um, yeah, I mean, C-sharp events tend to be a good way to handle input and responding to actions or things that have happened, right? I use events a lot. It's very easy to get overcomplicated with events. If you have events that are triggering other events that are triggering other events, um, it's going to get hard to follow the flow of the code. But events tend to be a good way to um, to make it so that you can register for things in unrelated systems and get callbacks and updates on stuff like that. Try not to use them inside the same class or the same system as often though, because that, that, that's when it tends to get overcomplicated for me. I don't know how often you use events, Charles. I mean, I use them when I need them and sometimes it's a lot, sometimes it's sparsely. Um, I think my biggest suggestion would be if you're using events because they can get complicated um, is to log a lot, log everything. And, you know, sometimes you log, it seems like you log too much. So you want to, I guess, do anything you can to mitigate scrolling blindness, you know, by having, you know, too many logs that look the same. Um, But yeah, no, logging, logging is key when it comes to all these events, because you just need to be able to follow. And it's very hard to follow along something if uh, you just have no, you know, no information to work with. Yeah, it, it certainly can be a pain. Um, it is nice, though, when you look at the debug login in, in your console, you'll be able to see the call stack of those events a lot of the time and mm-hmm. see exactly where things came from. But the problem I run into, too, is like uh, events that accidentally are triggering themselves or triggering another event that triggers the first one and you end up with a weird infinite loop and Unity crashes. I've had that mm-hmm. happen a couple of times. One of them was semi-recent where I just... It was a side effect of naming variables too close to each other. So called one event, meant to call the other one. And it was just calling the same one over and over in a loop. <laughs> and yeah, blows up the editor, everything crashes and it sucks. But eventually you catch it after like the third time. Like, why does it keep crashing? Oh, shit. My code's bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's see, um, what other things we got? How, how to make a complex UI for shop missions and manage all the stuff in there that might update from one thing in the game to somewhere else, like Subway Surfer. Oh, this is a good question. I think this is more about separation than anything, right? So it, it, if you have a complex UI that's managing the stuff, you really don't want the UI to have much, if any, state or control of, or knowledge of the state. You wanna bind it up to the data that's actually kind of controlling your game. So if you have your, you know, whatever, your missions list stuff, it should be pulling from mission list data that's the same data that your game is using and then using that to display it Um, same with like coins or anything else like all of that stuff there shouldn't really be much logic in the ui other than selecting things what's available and um that's about it and then the other code that's shared should be handling all of the what that data is and how how it reacts to those things and how it does callbacks oh jason said something interesting huh oh log each event as it comes yep (laughs) It's and also it's on board with log and stuff. You made a good point about having like an event dispatcher. That way you have one place where you route your events through. Oh yeah. That'll work great. Makes it easier to follow, but you know, it's like, it, you know, anything in development, you know, readability, you know, being able to have someone else look at your code base and have a good idea of what's going on. And I think events, I, I struggle with that because events really do kind of hide a lot of what, of what's going on. 
and you really do have to follow things. Yeah. Um, yeah. It could be. It certainly can make it harder to follow. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but if it's done right and cleanly, I think some, a lot of times it, it'll simplify and make things easier to understand. Um, if the events are set up right and the hooks are, are good. Cause it's a lot easier to have like a, a data system that has a UI that's just listening to callbacks on something changing than it knowing about the UI and trying to call into the UI and uh, all in like your data related systems calling into all these other things. They really shouldn't, they should just be exposing when things change or when things happen that other things need to know about. Right. Okay. A um, couple more questions. Can you do fixed when, fixed split windows instead of switching to them um i would love to martin but i have not figured out how the hell to get that to work in zoom <laughs> i think we can work on that this week it's, yeah the docs that i found mentioned a bunch of buttons that i don't have and i don't know why so i, I don't know <laughs> if they just haven't updated them or if i'm blind which is probably the more likely option. Right? Maybe, like, maybe I can design some fancy like side by side. We can put it in OBS or something. Well, there's like time. a four by four mode and that's like normally there by default. When I talk to people, it's fine. Whenever I hit the stream button, it like disappears. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> and maybe it's the type of meeting. I'm not sure. Oh, we'll figure it out for the next one though. But yeah, it would be nice to just be four by four or whatever and then have the, the desktop going to at the same time. Um, not a coder, but I want to make Unity games. How should I start? Learning C Sharp separate from Unity and after that learn Unity or can I start with Unity directly? It's all you, Charles. You oh, think? I'm sorry. What was that question? He wants to know if you should start learning Unity or C Sharp outside of Unity and then learn Unity or uh, jump straight to Unity and C Sharp. Well, I mean, I, it couldn't hurt to learn C Sharp. I guess it just, a lot of it really depends. You know, I, I wouldn't say there's one right path. I mean, yeah. If you learn C-sharp first, I mean, look, if your goal is you want to make games for fun and you just want to get into it and you've got some ideas and you're like, you're not, you don't work for a company, you're trying to, you're not trying to find a job. You can probably take a hybrid approach, you know, get unity, try to play with it, then learn a little bit of C-sharp, um, try to answer questions to fill in gaps as you learn unity. Um, because learning unity means you're, I mean, when you learn unity, you're learning a tool, you know what I mean? It's like a, an artist learning Photoshop. You say, oh, should I learn Photoshop or should I learn, you know, color theory first? Well, I mean, what are you trying to do? So if you're just trying to learn programming and programming fundamentals and you've never programmed in your life, you know, that's probably a healthy place to start. Um, but if you want to make games. If you want to make games in particular, I mean, yeah, I, I would say learn some Unity because if you're just if your goal is just to make games, you're definitely going to want to learn programming, but you could theoretically pick up like a visual scripting tool or maybe if your game is you know simple enough it you know you could pick up some framework like um i don't know what i don't really use any of them but there's like there's like this one game maker i think is what it's called playmaker a couple yeah. others yeah i would um yeah you can get pretty far with those <laughs> you can he, i think he, he sounds like he wants to learn to he, well it says i'm not a coder and i want to learn to make games so yeah, that is an option, definitely. If you don't want to learn how to code, you can go with the visual stuff. Um, if you do want to learn how to code, though, you, I would say, yeah, just get into Unity. Start building games. Uh, the one downside to going out and learning a more academic C-sharp or like web-based stuff or you know, Windows tools that you would build in C-sharp is that you're going to learn some things that are great patterns outside of game development that don't work well at all in game development. And you're going to probably focus on a couple things that are very different. Like if you're building web stuff, you don't really think about garbage allocation. If you're building a game, garbage allocation is a big deal. It's mm -hmm. not a big deal when you start out, but you can get into the pattern of not even thinking about it when you're doing web stuff. Um, and th there are a lot of just, I think patterns like that, that really don't apply to game development, that it's easy to learn and kind of fall into. And it's also easy to try to figure, I found that a lot of people that know C-sharp, they'll try to figure out how to do things that are already done in Unity because they didn't start with Unity. So they don't know that a lot of systems exist and they try to rebuild the systems with the knowledge that they have of C-sharp. So I would, yeah, probably just start building games, go through some simple tutorials, um, and then mix in some code tutorials too. Maybe grab a Pluralsight course on C Sharp, but I wouldn't do that first. Jump into Unity, build a little bit, get familiar with it, and then start wondering what things are. Wonder what the word class means. Why is it there? What the hell is it? Go look mm -hmm. it up and start figuring that out and then go on to 
why is this public? What does that mean? And start watching a bunch of videos on those as you come across problems. I find it easier to to retain if I'm working on a problem and mm -hmm. finding the solution than if I'm just looking at a bunch of information that I'm not actually able to use. And building games makes it easy because you can use it, share it, and show everybody the thing that you built with it. Mm -hmm. That's right. I well, agree. Okay. Um, I'll take another question, but um, I'm also going to ask everybody to hit the like button one more time because we're only at 30. <laughs> There's 130 people watching. Only at 10. Come on. <laughs> Either they don't <laughs> like it the or, <laughs> or maybe we just need to get on to talking about game stuff. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Uh, declaring events in an interface. Is that an anti pattern? No, I, I do that. I occasionally declare events in interfaces. Not common, uh, but I definitely do it. I don't know about you. Do you ever put in events in I interfaces? I honestly can't think of a single time I've done that, but an anti-pattern? I don't know. Oh, you think about like notify property changed? Yeah, oh, true. Okay. I notify property changed. And I do things like that where I'll have events that have some sort of a callback that's in the, you know, or interfaces that have some sort of event that's callback. Yeah. Not super common though. Not like hundreds of them throughout the project, but I can think of two or three in one project right now. Mm -hmm. Um. Let's see. I saw a question on the uh, chat, but it looks like Jason answered it. Oh, good. About component. It looks like about uh, UI stuff, right? Separating canvases yeah. out and, and async await and versus like coroutines and stuff. But yeah, what, what he said. Oh. It's good. Can you make something like Age of Empires in Unity? You definitely could. In fact, one day I probably will build an RTS game when I get bored. I mean, when I get enough time to do it, because I'd really love to make like a new command and conquer generals that's like a thousand players or something. I don't know. I got like a million RTS ideas. Yeah, it's definitely possible though. You could do that. Um, <laughs> you can make a, an RTS in just about anything. It just takes time and networking experience and yeah, a lot of discipline, I guess. Um, anything else for questions or I think you want to get off to uh, building something. Let's do it. Let's build some. So we were talking about building out a game. Oh, you know what? I wrote out in the in my notebook. Let me see the name of that game, if I can find it. Okay. So I wrote in another notebook the name <laughs> of that game. Let's see if it's in my notebook. <laughs> um, well, no, here's this is this is the problem that I have, right? Like, I like to write things down in notebooks. <laughs> But then I, when I can't find a notebook, I just Damn. grab another one. Yeah. No <laughs> like, Dude, I, I wouldn't know what I would do without if I didn't have a notebook next to me at all times. I just con I'm constantly grabbing out new ones and I, I just lose it. Which which one I'm in. So let's see. Did I write down the name of the game that I wanted to build? Well, while he looks for that, here's a book I'll recommend to everyone. It's called Starting to Unit Test, Not as Hard as You Think by Eric Dietrich. Eric Dietrich is a really good blogger check out his blog and um his book is really good and it's very light so you can you could probably get through this and like i mean if you read it you can do it in one sitting i would think it's only 100 it's less than 100 pages and there's not really exam i mean it's not really heavy so i don't know recommendation for you game what's it called there. it's called starting to unit test not as hard as you think by eric nice. Dietrich. Yeah, and it's not. Uh, I I like the title because I think people think that unit testing is hard, and it's because in reality, unit testing is hard if you try to just slap it into your existing project. It's nearly impossible, and it's a nightmare. And <laughs> I don't know if you've yeah. ever tried to do that, like take a three-year-old project and slap unit tests on it. Oh, Even God. like a web project, it's not an easy thing to do. So yeah, it's um, hard. but if you're starting out new, it's it's easy if you start out with a clean project and it'll make things just better in general. So I found the game. It was called Fill the Line. I'm going to just uh, post Fill a link in the chat line. and show like the, the example. And unless anybody has a much better idea, I think this is the one that we'll just do a quick build out of and figure it out. Do you see it, Charles? I'm looking it up now. Oh, I just you, you pasted put it, it in chat. So you drag a line here. Let me, um, I'll screen share. Okay. There, and we're gonna share this main screen there. So I don't know if you guys can all see. Oh, look, I see a side by side now. <laughs> Let's see what Zoom looks like. Okay. So in Zoom, you can see it. Here's the game. It's very simple. Take this, you drag, and you get to the end. 
like I won, woo, right? But it gets more and more complicated, right? So you go around corners, it's slightly more complicated. And eventually you get to parts where you're wrapping over and um, let's see, did it make it? And the levels are pretty complicated. Uh, let's go to one of the further ones. So I went through and played this a couple of times to try to get an idea of how it plays and what it's like. And it's got all kinds of crazy things once you get further along, like, I don't know how you beat this one. <laughs> oh, I definitely can't do it that way. It's going to be like that. Wait, no. Oh, yeah. See, I messed it all up. <laughs> so but you, you get the idea, right? There. Like, you have to go through and build a line. You can't go back on, or you can go back, but you can't go, like, back over a previous one. Like, I can't cross over this. And, it, you know, you fill out a an area like, like, if I do this, I'm screwed because I can never get into there. So it's not a super complicated game. I think there are a bunch of different ways that we could implement it. Um, I don't know what, you, what you've got in mind. Does anybody have any other suggestion real quick before we do this or any reason we just jump to something else? Because if not, I think this is a fun one to do. What do you think, Charles? Yeah, it looks fun. I mean, uh, it's interesting because I was just noticing that you can actually beat the same level multiple ways. Yes, I think there are going to be uh, on a lot of levels. There are probably multiple ways to beat them. I think that that's more the case as you're earlier on too. Like, let me see, pick like a a medium one that's not super hard and not super easy. Like here, level ten. So here you'd go. Like you can only go around that way. Otherwise, you wouldn't make it. Right. Mm-hmm. All right. Maybe you can go this way too. Oh yeah, you could also go this way. So <laughs> yeah, you're right. So there's there's nothing really stopping it from from going that way. Um, so I guess I'll just kick up a new project. So I made an empty project. Um, it's still in a beta version. I haven't updated this version. Um, oh, but man. I don't think it's going to be an issue. And I figured we'd just start coding along. And uh, oh, man, I want I want to use that high definition render pipeline for this. The HDRP for our cube. <laughs> Hell yeah, man. <laughs> um, yeah, hopefully everybody can see everything. Is there, Does everything look okay on the screen there in YouTube or is it? Yeah, it looks good. I mean, um, you got a big... It's not too small. Oh, that There's a big dark section on the right. That might be... That really is there. my inspector tab. So for some reason, it's just an issue with this beta. I've have had where the, the tab like right. disappears and then this black area appears. I don't know. It's It's a new issue with this version of the beta. Okay. Okay, somebody else said it was too small. Let me see if I can change my display settings real quick. I'm someone just says, can my you add some... To, um, to 1080. What was that? Someone had said that, can you add some 3D flavor, flavor to this? this oh, concept? Um, possibly. I think probably lay down the groundwork and then, and then use 3D models after we got the, the basics. Yeah, we could do that. It'd be interesting. All right, so we've got, is, is this better? Can you see it a little bit bigger? I changed 1080p. It's looking good better. Per- Someone says perfect. That's a good sign. Great. All right. Um, Hilk, I guess idea. So how do you want to start? We got, mm. I, I guess like what I was thinking is there are a couple different ways that we could handle the, the data for this. We could either build out some sort of a 2D map of like all of the available spots and whether you're there or not. Mm-hmm. We could also just slap out cubes and check the distance if it's not farther than a meter away and you haven't touched it before it's valid too um or i don't know like it seems like there are probably a lot of options it's like implicit versus versus explicit you can explicitly define what your board is or you can just implicitly just by virtue of you know where you place the blocks and it checking in real time you know to know if if you've crossed if it's crossed over itself or if all the blocks have been filled in um, and I intentionally didn't think too much about the options so that this would be harder. Right? <laughs> I had not to think too much about what we could do or what, what we should do or ways to do it because you know, this is the kind of thing that would normally happen and come up with the problem and then think about what our options are, maybe even do a little research on possible options. Um, yeah. I, I feel like uh, I, I always like to start with the data structure first. And I just imagine like off the top of my head, um, I guess I'm just, I guess no idea is stupid. So I'm just going to say this. Maybe you have uh, like a two, like a 2D array to represent the board. And then every time 
the line enters into that space, you can inter increment a number. So let's say it's a, an int array is what I meant to say. So you increment. So if it goes over one space, it'd be one. And then if it ever goes greater than one, you know, you know that it's not filled or it's filled. Yeah, twice. We can just use bools too, right? Like on or bools. and only allow you to go to ones that are off. Yeah, that's true. So, that's true too. Let's, let's just, let's start. Um, I like to start with uh, with uh, data, you know, uh, the data first, and then try to like put it out into a log, and then and then work on the UI afterwards, or like the the visual representation of it. Let's call it game board for now for the data structure. Yeah, seems like a good one. Um, somebody asked if there was a reason we we're using this specific beta version. Um, no, it's just the beta version that I happen to have installed. So I've been using this beta version for some other stuff. Um, there might be an update available. There probably is. It's, yeah. The, the only reason is I'm trying to get used to the new UI, get really comfortable with it. And just, I also just kind of like some of the features in the, in the new editor. It seems faster, snappier, and just kind of cool. And yeah, like I'm mostly I gotten used to the new UI. All right, let's pull over Rider here. So anybody that's not using Rider, by the way, it's just uh, another code editor. It works same as Visual Studio. I just like it a little bit better because it gives me tips and hints and makes me slightly better coder. And I feel like it's a little faster and easier to use. I awesome. also love Visual Studio though. So I use it outside of this all the time for other stuff, but that like being clear on that. Okay. So our game board may or may not be a mono behavior. I'll make it not a mono behavior for now because we don't know that it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And um, get lots of zoom ticks here. Nice, nice, nice. And we're so, thinking yeah. an array of ints or array of bools, mm -hmm. double array. Like, a... yeah, and basically the game board will just encapsulate, you know, moving through the positions on that. But the idea. Okay, so is... it would encapsulate keeping track of um, yeah, which setting... one is current and. Um, because that's the other thing we need, right? We need like the current position. Mm -hmm. Sounds about right. Um, these obviously are not going to stay as public, badly named variables, but I want to give them something right now. So we need to keep track of like the current position, which would just be an X and a Y. Um, and then all of the available positions. And uh, anything else? Well, we don't know if this is going to be a mono behavior or not, but I reckon a, a, what do you call it? A constructor to create the array based on the sizes you passed in. Should we do that or should we do like a factory to generate these things? You can do that. Yeah, factory. Be nice. Let's try that. Get done with like that. A... <laughs> One line of code and I learned a new thing. Some people had never seen a double bool, bool array. Oh. Yeah, double array. So you get the first index and second index. <laughs> um, okay, so game board factory. We have like a public static game board. And then give it int. Um, so this is not going to give us custom fancy boards. It's just going to give us swear boards for now. I think mm -hmm. that's a good place to start, though. Yeah. And we do like a... Maybe it should just. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> right, right. <laughs> Maybe a constructor is the way because more I'm thinking about this. Yeah, let's do that. Let's change it. Let's so Ctor and Tab. By the way, well, if, if, if you if you wanted to keep those private, you know, you could just have the factory be a a subclass of game board, and then it would have access, I think, to the to the private variables. Yeah, I was just thinking more that um, we're not using the factory to do anything other than make a two by two array, so it might be overkill. Gotcha. Um, like I, I the default of like, hey, we should make a factory for this thing. I'm like, oh, <laughs> maybe we shouldn't. <laughs> you've you've broken the first rule. Don't overcomplicate things. <laughs> exactly. So we'll set our size x and y. Then we'll initialize positions. A new bool array of size x do we want to do width and then height yes x yeah width and then height yes or row oh wait, why did i make these floats sorry rows and, rows and columns 
Oh yeah. Ever you want to I like that more. <laughs> so this would be a current column. Current row. There we go. Mm -hmm. Wait, what's the problem here? Oh. Wait. Oh, wait a minute. What am I missing? Yeah, I don't know what, what happened. I almost never use double um double <laughs> <laughs> so. That should that should be fine. Maybe maybe you're just taking wait, yeah. Mouse over, let's see what, what he has to say. Expected. Can you, is it just yeah. a comma? Oh, is it comma? Yeah. Oops. No, I don't think it is a comma either. I'm trying to remember. It has been way too long. <laughs> Here, let me let me Google that. How to initialize <laughs> a <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly what I mean, right? Like the things that you forget. I have not done something like this. Since um, like... <laughs> all right. Multi-dimensional rays. So I've done the other ones too, where we do like a comma there. Oh, look at this. So yeah, like I think that's the you do it that way. But I've done the ones with two brackets. I just don't remember how I did them. <clears throat> I feel like I have two. Maybe that was C plus <laughs> plus. <laughs> Someone says uh, one is an array of arrays and the other is a 2D array. That's what it was. Oh, okay. Yeah, we were creating an array of arrays. That makes sense. So. Okay, and then this is the multi-dimensional array. Much better. Thank you. Again, <laughs> kind of stuff happens all the time. Okay, so here we go. We got a multi-dimensional array of bools in a game board that we will create. Um, all right, so if we create it like this, like our first game board creator, let's see, how do we want to do that? So I, I like the first thing I want to do is just create like a game board that's maybe like two by two. Got it. So that we just like do, because uh, I think the line one is really boring. <laughs> so do like a two <laughs> by two, a two by two board. Um, and then we need to represent it visually and create it. So make a mono behavior that just creates a game board for now. Yeah, sounds good to me. Game board creator. Nice. It's my test class to make a game mm -hmm. board. So do like a on enable. Ah. Mm -hmm. Columns. Do we do columns and rows? Um, that's a good question. I think we okay. did. Yeah, we did columns and rows. Okay, so this would be like, I'm just gonna set these to two. Again, you're making them public because this is a little throwaway class. <laughs> these will get renamed if we actually decide to keep any of this. But I think right now, just use two by two, we'll create a new game board and then um, make that game board visible somehow. Yeah, so now that, that'll, that'll be the challenge displaying so it. So now we need to bind it up to something that can render it. Well, first let's move the game board creator into its own file mm -hmm. alt enter by the way so you just select the class anybody who didn't see that you just go on it select the class hit alt enter and there's a, a move to type if you're already in there and it's a different class than the file name so just moved it right over to its own class so this is going to make my game board um and then we want to yeah do something in in here to actually show the game board and render it now so i think we need some sort of a view layer um i don't know if we want to do this in UI or 3D. I mean, I guess we talked about doing it, may, maybe adding a 3D component. So we just build it as a 3D game instead yeah. of a 2D UI one, just in case we decide to go with that route. <laughs> <So> <laughs> yeah. let's select the main camera. I'm just going to reset the camera over to zero, raise it up a little bit on the Y, and then point it down, which I think is what 90 on the X. You could like genericize it by having an interface called game board drawer and however it decides to draw it. Yeah, I think we're going to have to do something like that. Let's hear let, I'll just make a empty cube at zero, zero real quick. Mm -hmm. um, and look at the game view. And then um, actually here, let's play side by side. So I, th what I was thinking and Charles, let me know if you got other ideas or better way to do this. Okay. But what I was thinking is we could just um, set up some class 
that is responsible for just spawning a prefab at each of those positions and mm-hmm. then rendering that thing basically a prefab or a cube that's mapped straight over to our data structure so a, a position on the board so when that position on the board changes or the cube changes or when the cube send the cube maybe is i guess the cube is getting the input and then sending something to the game board yeah, I mean, the, the cube the cube technically represents would represent like a space that is uh accessible i guess you know where you could draw a line yeah and then so you know when and it could be anything i mean it could be a cube it could be you know like you said if we use a ui um but whenever it receives the input that we'd expect i imagine it would send a signal down to the game board the actual data structure to to notify it hey look i'm moving to this location it seems right all right um so let's get the view set up. Um, some sort of a game view that just draws it. Well, first, let's see. Let's move this stuff around. So I'm going to take the camera here and just pull it up. Mm-hmm. Go up to like 10 meters. And set this to a solid color clear and just make it like black so that it looks cool, right? <laughs> um, and then the other thing I want to show real quick before we go into the code is if I duplicate this cube and move it over, see so if we get the perspective change. So it'll go to the camera and change that to orthographic. So they look nice and flat. So yeah, I was thinking we'd make a class, like a, what do you want to call it? To render the game board. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, oh, wow. Game, game, game board uh, view. I don't know. That sounds awful. That was as good as I came up <laughs> I with so that. far, too. I was saying, like, it was like a game board view. I don't know. Like, <laughs> or game okay. view, game board drawer. I don't know. That's like something on Unity property drawer, drawer. Or it does kind drawer. of sound like a pop property drawer or drawer. I think it's draw, drawer. <laughs> drawer. Oh, wait. Drawer. What? Okay. Um, so here, like, set game board. This is really just like a binding command. So we need some some way to, when we create a game board, bind that game board up to the view. Right, so I think the game board creator could just call create a game board and then pass it into the view for now. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've been, what I've been doing lately is instead of set, doing a bunch of setters and getters on mono behaviors, I've just been more comfortable leveraging the attaching them to the same game object and calling get component. I mean, we can do whatever, but I just. Oh, but I, this one's not a. Um, oh, the game. Oh, you're right. Uh, the game board is not bad. a mono behavior, right? Because it's yeah. going to change every time we generate a new one. Yep. yep if right. we want to be able to dynamically do them or. Forgot we haven't. Uh, yeah. But yeah, no, totally agree. I, I get component all the time, just in a way. The only time I don't do it is on things that have to get newed up all mm-hmm. the time throughout the project. Right? So we're not generating, but or allocating a bunch of stuff or making get component calls at runtime, do them all in a wake. But yeah, I totally agree there. Um, so we set a game board and do like game board like that and generate a field for it. So this will be our reference to our game board. And then, um, oh, let's see. Do we need anything? Oh, this shouldn't be public. Private. We probably don't need anything in an update yet. What I was thinking is um, we were talking about events. Mm-hmm. Maybe we should just have an event in the game board that calls back when a thing changes. Well, actually, no, let's just render first. Right? Before anything else, let's just do the, do the damn drawing. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds so good. So to get the game board, we need to instantiate the prefabs. So I think what I was going to do is just make a prefab field where we can just put in a cube mm-hmm. and then have it spawn them all out. Yep. I'm all about it. So to add a serialized field, it'd be a private game object. Um, let's call it cube prefab. And then in here, we'll loop through the game board. So say like for each um, column in, or no, we need to do a loop, right? We need to do a for loop. <laughs> yeah. From I is zero to game board dot Oh, we don't have a um. We don't have those exposed. 
Yeah, right. I was wondering about that. Like, what's That's the best okay. way to... Uh, we, can, we can do that. So it's pulling the scale ticks a couple. Um, so to do that, we'll just add a public int columns with a getter and a private setter. You know, I'm pretty sure with alt enter, you can go to... Oh, never mind. I'm dumb. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> oh, wait. We do this, right? Can Generate, you? introduce a get only auto property for rows. Watch this. Yes. Okay. I'm not dumb. Okay. Good. Oh, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way that I should have done it. Shortcuts. Shortcuts. The king. There. And I fixed that one because I didn't do the other one right. So now these are set up as uh, getters only. So they can only be set in the constructor. In fact, we can make them uh, read only. They definitely can't. Oh, well, wait. Then they have to be fields. No, that's fine because that's just a getter. You, you'd make the, the ones below. Oh, wait. No. Actually. No, I think I want to do it like this. So they, they're, they are public fields, but they're um, read only. So yes. they can only yeah, okay. change in the constructor. And I was only thinking because that actually makes sense for this scenario, right? Like in this case, we mm -hmm. literally only ever want those to change in the constructor. So yeah. making them public read only fields will work. Yeah. That makes sense. And it's more explicit too, because if you make it a property with just a getter, I don't know. I think it's more, I think it's more explicit to say, Hey, look, these are read only properties. Yeah. It's definitely less ambiguous because our read or a getter only property could be anywhere, but a read only field like this means it's definitely set in the constructor. I'm going to move these all up, by the way. So it's just um, Alt Shift and just move these things up here somewhere. That's another one. That's kind of in the right order. order and get rid of all the extra using statements because we don't really need a bunch of extra junk in the code. Okay. That looks good. Um, we're still not using these, so I'm going to ignore them for now. So we loop through gameboard.columns. And maybe I should rename this to like column. And then for each row or for the rows, we'll do int uh, row, we go gameboard.rows. So that's going to give us a loop through all of the columns and all the rows. Then we just need to create a cube. Um, the game, somebody asked what game we're making to. It's this um, weird little, what's it called? Fill the line game. So you just look it up, you'll see it. That's what we're going to build out. Um, let's see. So next step, instantiate the prefab. Yep. And I guess in this case, this is like a primitive sort of case. We're just going to put it at the world position based on the column and row. Oh, yeah. It actually makes a lot of sense. Make it nice and simple. And we can always offset that. Uh -huh. uh, yep. You do an instantiate of the cube prefab. Give it a position. So give it like a. All right, here. Actually, let's let's pull that part out. Let's just do the position. Var position equals new vector three. And we're gonna give it column, comma, whoops, no, call. Comma zero, comma row. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. The I think so. I the think middle, yeah. the middle one would be your yeah y up and down in world space. And then you need to give it a quaternion. Actually, you know what I want to do is set this as um. Oh, wait, no. Let me think. I want to instantiate it as a child of this. I think then I'll just set the position. Is there an overload for that? There's I so think, many instantiate overloads. There we go. Uh, so you got, so if you just do the, you can do the position and a quaternion. But I want it, I want the parenting first because I want these to all be children of the view. Got it. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. So, I don't think they have an overload for that one. All good. We'll just set the position. Okay. Then I guess I don't need this. Need a variable there to use two lines later. Okay, so that should spawn. So we set a game board, spawn a bunch of things. Um, that's it. Let's save. Yeah, it looks simple enough. Go back over here, actually set it up and test it out real quick. I just realized all my lights turned off. Why'd that happen? Someone says you can pass a third argument as the parent. Let me look that up. Can you pass that with a position though? Because I feel like you, 
you know, you should be able to. I, I would mean, think just, so, but there's so many overloads. <laughs> I've I lost know, track. Like a million of them. All right. So entering this cube into a prefab. Yeah. Well, it's going to be the prefab position quaternion. And then finally the last one's the parent. Oh, okay. Try that. Like oh, and also, that. oh, you have to, yeah, the position. Fun fact. Oh, you can do that too. You could, uh, there's a shortcut control alt V. It'll actually introduce a variable. Oh, yeah. Interesting. I don't think I've tried that one before. All right. So now we're instantiating it in one call, even better. So tiny performance improvement. And then let's see um, what well, we need to make prefab. Create a folder, prefabs, and we'll just take our beautiful cube and drop it into there. <laughs> then we make a game object for our, what did we call that thing? The something, something spawner. Game board viewer, I think, or creator. Yeah, we need both. Game board creator and a game board view. And assign the scripts. Assigned and assigned. And then we got to set up that... Uh, the cube prefab here. So go down to prefabs and assign the cube prefab. And if I save my scene. Is, it, is the creator calling a game board view? It is not. <laughs> if I save my scene and hit play, nothing <laughs> will happen. I was waiting for you. <laughs> Get a com compiler error maybe. Let's see. Let's see if I can build real quick. Make sure the error is gone. Yeah, just, yeah. Okay, cool. So set game board actually needs to get called by the creator. Somebody was talking about um, using var. I see. I agree. About that. All, I, I don't like to use. Uh, what are you? Are you? You like to be explicit? It depends. I use var on things like if we go back over here, like position. Yeah, I know it's a vector three, right? Like it's named position. It's right there. It's fine. Um, and the instance of the game object in, in the cases where I know the type. And it's really obvious. I use var. When it's not obvious, then I um, then I switch to the variable name. As soon as as soon as I like can't look at it and just know, then I'll switch to the variable type. Unless mm -hmm. the variable type some obscenely long thing, you know, thirty plus <laughs> characters long. All right. Um. So set game board needs to get called by the game board creator. So we create it. Um. We'll just find it for now. Ah, that's wrong. Game board. Get rid of that extra using statement too. Okay, so there we go. That should find it and set the board whenever we re-enable the board creator. By the way, I like to use on enable for these just so I can toggle the thing on and off and run the code a bunch of times. Nice. <laughs> get, get lazy. <laughs> yeah, let's just flip that on and off. I also get used to like projects where starting up sometimes takes a long time. So being able to just toggle a game object on and off to run code makes it easy. Let's see, let's hit play. And okay, well, something happened, right? So game board view ran, we got some cubes. I think it worked. It did. Our cube is a looked... big square. <laughs> Does, it just looks like a big. Oh, hey, I gotta right, take let's a see. call. So if I disable a cube. I'll be right back, I gotta take a quick phone call. Yeah, go ahead. So yeah, it looks like it's all working, right? We've got our four cubes here. Um, I could change the color of them or something and you'd see that they're all different, but We've got the four basic empty cubes there, right? I'm um, going to use var for loops just because int and var are the same length. So using int just, yeah, there's, there's no benefit. Plus if I type four and hit tab, it's going to auto pick int. So I don't have to type that out. No reason for me to go back and change it, make it less obvious. Um, so yeah, I think we've got the view set up and the next part's going to be reading inputs and uh, sending that data back down. Well, here, let's, let's play with that creator real quick, right? So if I change the creator and make this like five rows and three columns and hit play, we should see the same result. There we go, bam. Um, we could definitely do an outline around them or something. It's just that in the actual game that we're cloning, that's not really how they are. They're more like this, they're these gray areas. And then we're clicking through and, um, and filling them out. In fact, perhaps I should change it so that the background is white and that these are gray. Let's let's reload this one more time. So I think that, that would help. Um, let's play. I'm gonna get back in. But yeah, I think uh, white white backgrounds and and gray inside. Let's see. Let's try like level nine. Yeah. So let's go for that. Let's go for white 
on the back and this light gray in the front. I'll make these changes right now. So take the gray, or here, let's take the, the main camera background to solid white. I'll look at that, we can see a little outline there of our, our cube. And then I'll take the cube and, oops, gotta go select it. And oh, we need to make a material for it. So we'll go in, create a folder for art. I'm not gonna have much art, so I'm just gonna put the material right here. And we'll just create a new empty material and call this cube. And we'll assign that to our cube. Just drop it right on. Um, where's our renderer? Mesh renderer materials. There we go. Like blind today. So anyway, we assign it to there. Then we can expand it out and change the color to be more of that gray. There we go. And let's apply that prefab change. So let's go up to overrides and just hit apply all. So it updates our prefab. Hit play one more time. And we should see cubes that look a little bit more like that. There we go. Not bad. Um, now, the other thing that they did is that they were starting off with a cube enabled, right? So that it was green and selected. I don't know if we should start there or if we should just jump over to um, being able to open and select stuff. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, just looking real quick for any other questions too. Could use it for chunk loading. Um, not really. It would. Um, you need to load in chunks of stuff in slightly different way. You want to do them all asynchronously and stuff. Are there other questions, real quick? Following tutorial series, I was creator into nested if statements. Three levels of nesting. Oh, okay, that's what the discussion's about. Yeah, nested if statements tend to be terrible. They tend to be like an easy way to solve a problem immediately, but then it turns into a bit of a mess and gets very, very hard to follow later and really easy to break things. Um, I try to minimize your nesting of things. Let's see, anything else? Um, yeah, the camera could find the center point of the grid. Somebody had mentioned that. So we'll do that later. We'll just move the camera over. And then um, I think that's it. So I'm just gonna jump back into coding unless people pop up more questions. So we've got the board here and the next thing we need to do is read some sort of input. Here, let's hit play again, see what it looks like. But we need to read some sort of input and look for me holding down the button and what cube I'm on. And then we need to send that to something. So let's make a, um, let's make a little game controller. I don't know exactly what I want this to do and how I want to architect it out. So let's we'll start with something simple like a game controller, and then we can split out the functionality from that as we go along. By the way, everybody is still watching. If you're still watching, you don't mind hitting the like button and sharing, that'd be super helpful. Uh, it just gets it out there for more people, more people join and we get to do more cool, fun stuff. All right, so we got a game controller and in here, I lied about the name. I think this is really gonna be starting off as like an input controller. So let's make that explicitly private. And then let's do something to read the input. So say like if input dot mouse, but get mouse button, yeah, get mouse button zero. So this is whether or not we're holding down the left mouse button. So if we are holding down the mouse button, um, try select new cube or try move to new cube. Let's try that. I think that'll be my name, name for the method. So let's hit enter and create a method for that. And next thing I wanna do is just figure out what cube that I'm on. It is default to private. Somebody asked the method here when it's like that is defaulted to private. I just have a habit of making them say private so that when they're all collapsed, they line up nice and neatly. It drives me nuts when they don't line up now. It didn't used to, I used to not do that at all, but now I'm weird and I just do it every time so that they line up. Hey, what's up, Charles? You're muted, but welcome back. Hey, thanks for letting me know. No. <laughs> I started no. talking to no one. Just sat here and talk. Like, that's very interesting. Tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny. Uh, so, setting up a game controller, Charles. I answer, answer a couple quick questions and then setting up a game controller to read input and then try to enable a cube. Um, so, what I was thinking is we'll just do a recast from the camera, shoot in, see if we find a cube, and then see what. Um, what position that thing is associated with. Although we don't have any of that information yet, so. Alrighty. 
So I think we'll do like a um, ray, ray equals camera, and I'm gonna do something dirty here, main, camera.main, <laughs> the screen point to ray. So if you use camera.main, like don't use it for real, we're just using it temporarily because it finds the thing by tag every time you do it. So we're gonna cache, we're gonna use the camera, we're gonna get position of uh, vector 2.0. And the reason for that, or sorry, vector 2.1 divided by two. That's what I like to do. So what we're doing there is just getting a ray into the screen from the center of the screen. So when you pass in screen point to ray, it's zero to one, like from the bottom to top and left to right. So if we go 0 0.5, 0 0.5, it's right in the center. So we just do a ray cast straight in the center. Okay, camera dot main. It's beautiful. We'll cache that later. In fact, we could even um, we could do something like add an awake or an on enable, and just do camera equals find object to type, and we just find the only camera that we're gonna have. There. Let's do that. Let's let's pretend that we're keeping things somewhat clean. There we go. No camera dot main. So we'll find the one camera right when we enable our controller. And we'll use that. Now, normally we should have some sort of a camera controller or something to, to manage all this, but we're only going to have one scene, I think. So we'll do a ray cast and then, or we'll get a ray, then do a ray cast. So do if physics dot ray cast and we give it um, our ray out. This is part I love, by the way. Ray cast hit. Hit info and a uh, max distance. Um, really, I don't even care about a max distance. Like we, we're, we don't have any background, right? We don't have anything to, <laughs> to go back against. So we just want to get the first thing. Um, I love that we can declare the type though here in the outs. It's nice now. Not having to do that in a line before and initialize it. So then we want to get the cube. So we say hit info dot get com or dot collider dot get component. And we want to get something for our game piece. Um, we don't really have anything like a script on there. So I think maybe we should just create one. I call this like a game cube. And we'll call that var game cube equals that. So we'll need to create a component for game cube. Does that make sense to you, Charles? Is making a component. I was thinking this could just have its position on it basically. Yeah, it's going to have it. It's it's X and it's Y um, as variables instead of using the transform position in the world because it seems dirty. So yeah, I'll generate a type for it and we'll make it a mono behavior and we'll make that public. I feel like we'll have we'll do some renaming later. But yeah, the idea is good. GameCube is perfect. I'll name the next <laughs> class Nintendo. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> NES. Oh. No, like so that. for this, we'll have a um, public um flow no int row with a getter and a column and then um public void like what do we want to do just like an initialize to set these oof that only sets them if they're not set yeah Right here, let's let's do an initialized variable. Mm, invalid operation exception. Now, normally I wouldn't just go around throwing exceptions in here, but it's just going to log out an error if we screw it up. Um, generally, throwing an exception is not something I would necessarily want to do i'd probably just do a log or something but yeah. here it's going to throw and just put an error right in there and say hey stop being stupid um i think it's fine for this warning game. or something yeah it, it, well in this case yeah it probably should just be let's do it. you let's already do did it. this let's do what i would really do right <laughs> we would log an error um try to initialize game cube and we'd give it like a Game object dot name. By the way, the dollar sign here makes it so we can put the little brackets and start filling things in. At yep. string interpolation, in case anyone wants to know what that's called. Comma, column. It was already set to row 
comma column. There we go. Um, I don't know. Whoops. If that formatted right, but what is first? Let's fix the spelling. I N I T I A L I Z. There we go. So it'll just say that we tried to initialize the cube, give us the name of the cube if we happen to put a name there, the new the position we try to go, and then the position it was at, and then we'll return. Sure. Uh, that shouldn't happen, but if we screw up and we try to initialize something that's already initialized, we'll get that yeah. problem. Okay. Uh, the next thing we do is just say row equals row, column equals column, and we're done. If anyone wants to know that that pattern, I guess if you, you can loosely call it a pattern, it's called the, the a guard clause. Having a an if statement that short circuits your your method. Oh yes, yes. Called the guard right clause. at the top, where you just check and bail out, log an error or something else. Um, private wait, setters. You got to add some private setters. Oh, to yep. you. yeah. Thank you. Do you have to make these settable? There we go. <laughs> So I think that's good. Let's move this to its own file. So again, anybody who's not doing this normally, just select the class, hit Alt Enter, and hit Move to Type, or Move Type to File, and it'll just move it right over. So now we've got a Game Cube initialize. Go back over to that Game Board um, view because the Game Board view is what creates the cubes. And here we'll just say instance dot initialize. Oh, wait, we're not initializing it as a GameCube, though. So we need to change this prefab type first. Mm. There we go. Then we can give it our row and column. Nice. Although, are we, did we do column and row on everything else first? We did. We did columns and then rows. So let's go into here and watch this. Um, what is it? Control-Shift-R, change signature. Watch this, Let's select my row and hit move down, hit next. Magic, Magic. <laughs> right. the joy of writer just <laughs> rearranged my variables because it also rearranged them here. I was like, that's why it's good because it fixed all the calls to it too. So now they map. <laughs> all right, so we're initializing the game cube. Our game board view is set up. Well, okay, we were gonna do the game controller. So now that we can get a game cube out of it, we just get those positions and set something on it. Um, I, I almost feel like like the GameCube should be responsible for telling us whether or not it's valid. Oh, Maybe valid not. Space. <clears throat> or whether or not it's already set. I don't know. Maybe no. And now I don't feel like that. I thought I felt like that for a second, but no, I don't. <laughs> let's see. So <laughs> our Let's see, our game controller. I think that our game controller needs a reference to the game board. Does that make sense? Um, let me see. Let me catch up here. Oh, so, so you're trying to move to the new cube. So the whole goal was hold down the mouse button, try to move to a new cube. So we can figure out what cube is there, but then we need to link that to the game board data and um, get the state of that position. Well, the, yeah, I think at the end of the day, the game board, yeah, is the is the object that knows the state. So, so I was thinking is like right now our game board, um, it sets the game board on the view. Maybe it should set it on the game controller, and then the game the view should just look at the controller. That make more yeah. sense. Yeah, let's try that. So do like a, you know, game controller setting. So this would be game controller. And then we'd make set game board there, which would just do that and get rid of all the extra code. Anybody who hasn't used these, by the way, they're just uh, expression body methods. So it's just set a simple setter. We can use the Lambda here and then put the one line of code that it's gonna do. Since it's just setting, it's fine. Um, so we'll set the game board there. Um, and then the game board view. Oh, maybe this is a good time to use events. All right, the game board view could just <laughs> listen for the game board updating. Um, so, yeah, and then update update its uh, spaces accordingly. Yeah, I think so. Does that make sense? Does that seem like a good idea? 
So the game board view right now is only responsible for basically drawing a representation of the game board in the scene. Yes. For, well, it's really for handling those cube prefabs, right? So it's spawning them. Mm -hmm. um, and then those things are able to be collided with, with the, the simple raycast. So it has a reference to a game board. So basically when things happen on the, the I don't think game, it even needs a reference to the game board though. Right. It doesn't. Does it? I mean, at this point, well, I mean, at this point, all it's responsible for is just drawing it initially. Yeah. It's really like a game board spawner. Yeah. Um, Which, and when you think about spawner, like, I mean, technically the game board is spawned in memory, but this is responsible for spawning its, its representation. And in this case, it's, its representation is it just builds a bunch of cubes. So technically, it, I mean, it could draw it as a, any way we want. I mean, we could draw it in the console or we could draw it in the, uh, you know, draw with with the ui but I, I think right now it's just putting these cubes in 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 space yeah um all right so i want to rename this yeah, draw game board i mean i want to change it again i think but i think that seems okay <laughs> um so okay if we go this route then the game controller should find the camera it should we don't necessarily need a game board creator anymore. Uh, this was initially going to be a temporary class, but I also don't want to put rows and columns into game controller. So maybe I'll keep this around for now. Yeah. I don't know, but if you think about it, game controller, you know, oh, well, yeah, never mind. I was going to say game controller fundamentally controls the game. So, you know, maybe it should have access to the columns and rows for this particular game. But it should be getting that from somewhere else, right? Let's maybe make a scriptable object. Yeah, maybe. Give it a, a set of scriptable objects. Call it game data. settings uh, or level. I mean, because you know, if you think about it, it's the levels, the one who knows. That's Each true. level has a different set of rows and columns, and you know, it has a whole board. You know, if you put to do colon in front of a, a comment like that, um, yeah. Writer treats it as something. A Visual Pops Studio up down here. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Another tip for you guys. Show I'm like a writer the, power user. In the to do list. Yeah, I think that that's a good idea though. I think we'll keep going, build it, and then uh, turn this into some sort of level scriptable object or data structure or something. Yeah. Um, seems right. Yeah. Somebody mentioned public is for more than the inspector. Yeah, public is for. Um, accessing things outside of the code and generally bad that's one of the reasons that these need to change like these should be serialized fields that are private um Ooh, another um fun tip i think it's a uh, s if you type s prop it, that's um that's a live template for serialized fields you type s what s, uh, s field All right now hit tab now you oh. can Int and then tab. That's and not bad. <laughs> uh, that's a new one for me. All right, I'm learning new things. Thank you. <laughs> and then S prop will make a serialized serialized field that acts as a backing uh, property for for a private field. S prop. Oh, <laughs> that is beautiful. All right, I'm learning more shortcuts. I love it. Don't forget to hit like for um, Charles' shortcuts. <laughs> <laughs> on my video not his <laughs> no don't don't hit it on his right. <laughs> okay um let's see so we've got the the game controller and the game controller getting enabled is now going to call the game board creator and just say get a game board um and we'll make this return a game board and we'll make it public so we'll do this, it'll just generate that, and we won't do that. Return game board. So this will be like a level or a level generator eventually. I got another uh, another little shortcut for you. If Now, I, th I think this might work, but, but I, it seems like you're using Visual Studio um, shortcuts for your, for your writer. I don't know if you set that up. I left it as a default writer one so I could get used to them. 
if you go to back over to that class, I think it was the game board creator. Yes. And you put your carrot anywhere in the word game board on that return. This one? Yeah. And if you hit control alt N, it should create an inline. It should inline it. It did not. Control alt N. No, it didn't. Darn. Yeah. I don't know what my settings are. I thought I had it. Mine is. Oh, mine are as IntelliJ. That's what it is. Because I come from oh, okay. Java. Because anyway, we could just return back that new game board. Yeah, yeah. I use like, it. I use that one. All, I use Control Alt V and Control Alt N all the time to inline and then create and introduce uh, variables. It, now, now it's just shrunk down to a tiny little expression. Body. Oh wow! <laughs> <Look at that. laughs> Writer. So this is again when people ask why I use Writer, it's because it just kind of reminds me to do things like this and shorten up the code and get rid of a bunch of extra nonsense. All right, so let's go back to the game controller. So game controller hits, we enable, we need to get the game board creator. So say like, or let's, let's add an awake here. Because what we'd really do is cache all this kind of crap in awake. So move that up here and we'll go um, game board creator. Let's find object type. Uh, and then in on enable, I want to actually create a board. So say like, Game board creator dot get game board. Okay, now we don't need a set game board method anymore because <laughs> that's already being done. And we can delete that. And then we just have to call into the UI. So find that um, game board view. We'll get the game board view right here and generate a field for that. And then we can just set the um, or what did, what do we call it? Oh, I forgot the name. This is the downside <laughs> to renaming things. Draw game draw, board. Draw game board, yeah. Okay, yeah. so now we'll create a board. Our game controller should have it and then tell our view to draw it. Let's try that. All right. Little and then we can start, here. We can start reading input. Oh, I changed the colors, by the way. I oh, okay. I in a way when I changed this. She's trying to blind me? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I was trying to match the um, the actual game. Uh, oh, we need a game controller. Let's create that. Game controller. Somebody asked um, why I put underscores there. Do you want to tell them why, Charles? Go back. Why, what, why I put underscores in the code? For the for the field names. Yeah. Uh, I I so. Basically, for private member variables, you preface, um, you prefix your variable names with an underscore. This is this is not a hard and fast rule. This is just general, generally accepted syntax. So for private member variables, I, I mean, I personally always put an underscore before uh, the variable name. For public uh, member variables, um, I make them uh, Pascal case, which is capitalized. Uh, the first level capitalized and the rest is camel case. I don't know how to describe it. Pascal no, case. You're right. That's, yeah, it's Pascal case. Now, I do the same. And it's the same reason. It's just to make it obvious that those are private member variables and that they're not parameters or something else. Another, yeah, Pascal case is basically standard naming, but you every word you capitalize. So it's not just like you capitalize the first letter, you capitalize every word. Um, and then camel cases, same, but the first letter is lowercase. I did not add the cube script to our cube. So getting errors. So um, what I was going to do is add that real quick. I just someone asked sure. what, a, what a member variable is. Just answer that since it's uh, related. A member variable is a, a variable that's associated with the, with the class. So like if he has the class game board, then the row and int variables are member variables. They're part of that class as opposed to being a, a variable of some other class. Um, there's something else I was going to say. Oh, on the same vein of naming things, um, what I, something that I've been doing recently. Oh. oh, can you hear me? I need to apply my prefab. Oh, God. I'm, yeah. I'm sitting here coding along while you're talking, and it's not working. <laughs> I didn't hit apply on the prefab. It happens all the time. I was about to start debugging. Go ahead. Keep going. Um, yeah, someone just put uh, M underscore. I, ah, gosh, I, that's such a pet peeve of mine. I never use that. But what I, what I was going to say is that something I've recently started to do is for serialized fields that are private, 
Um, I'll nix the underscore. So I'll just do camel case. Just something I've been doing with mono. And that's only in mono behaviors, obviously, and only for, for serialized fields. And I don't know, I, I kind of like it. For me personally, it is a solid indicator that something that I'm, a variable that I'm referencing is private, but accessible in the editor. And I think writer, writer even like will cat will um, make it bold if you get rid of the underscore. Oh, nice. Yeah. For a while, I got rid of the underscores completely and just used um, tooling to help with that. But then the problem that I ran into was that everybody else on the team isn't going to do it. Right? Like I've tried. You're not going to get everybody on the team to install special tooling. So unless like the default tooling does it and makes it obvious, um, I just go well, I don't for know, putting man. it in the code. If, if, if there's no tooling in place, then I'll bet, I think all bets are off. I think yeah. anyone's just going to. Well, do I mean, it. if there's no special tool, like if if everybody is using Rider, awesome. But a lot of projects I work on, like people are using Mono Develop or Visual Studio or other stuff, and getting them to do plugins that that do stuff and make it work right um, was just not possible. <laughs> I, yeah. I've tried. Um, so I ended up going back to underscores, and again, it's just literally so that you can tell the difference between um, between the. Uh, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, the, the private members, like, like Charles was saying, and like local variables or parameters that come in. And somebody else is mentioning the M underscore stuff again. Hey, I think the M was supposed to be an indicator that there was a member variable and there'd be like I underscore for integers. Some people would do that. And I think the initial idea was supposed to be that they were supposed to be named for things, not the type, but like the thing, like T was supposed to be for timers and C was for counts and stuff. Um, I just hate it because it's it's um, it's extra stuff that you have to type for no reason. Like, I don't need an M underscore to know that it's a member. Uh, the underscore is enough for me. Um, and then naming variables good enough tends to get around needing to put in the extra type stuff there. Um, I'm going to stop babbling on about that, though, because there's another issue here that my code's not working. Oh, wait, is it working? <laughs> Well, I just wanted to say, well, maybe while you debug that, and I'll help you in a second. It is uh, work. Jason, other Jason, uh, what other Jason? What do I? What do you want to be called? A piece of fruit? <laughs> 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 He's like, this needs to be a call-in show. Um, something he had said is like, you know, basically anything you add to your code is information. You know, I mean, you don't write code for the computer; you write it for your, you know, yourself. Well, we write we write code the way we do for ourselves, so we can read it. So, I mean, yeah, if the team you're on is like, hey, look, I'm, my eyes are really used to the M underscore, well, then that, in, that additional information is going to be valuable to that particular team. But, you know, when you really think fundamentally about the whole, hey, why do you put an underscore for private member variables? It really is just to, um, to in the simplest way, articulate to the reader that this is a private member variable, which may not be obvious if you're 100 lines deep and you can't see the private member variables, you know, on the on the screen, because, you know, if you have a, a local variable, then it's not going to have an underscore. So if you have two variables next to each other and you don't have an underscore for either of them, you're you're really not going to be able to tell. But again, really, you know, I don't know. There's the argument that you can say to each their own. But I think there are some things that, you know, are, are really are fundamentally valuable. And I personally think that that's that's one of them. I agree. That's my rant. I'm done. Yeah. Uh, good coding standards and naming is super important and it gets undervalued and underlooked a lot. So hundred percent on there. So I'm looking at my little LEDs lighting up over here. Every time I move, they're still <laughs> set up for the, the motion sensor in that dude. I got the, I don't know if you can see them here. The little lights pop on. Oh, does it light up? Can you see it on the screen? Kind of. It's uh, I can't get it to light up now. I can't move in front of it. Move. Motion sensor. Uh, these things are neat, but <laughs> there we go. It lit up. I don't know if you, there it's lit. Uh, and it went down. And I got a little speaker set up, but it's it's distracting. <laughs> I look over there, I'm like, oh, look at that. Lighting up in my face. Okay, let's get back on to um, on the code, I guess. So those exceptions you have, they look to be like. These uh, are all just editor problems yeah. with the beta. Um, th yeah, the code actually worked once I hit play and built. I think I hadn't built before so if i play i get a two by two cube everything i think kind of works um oops and if if i modify the creator like four by two we should get the cubes let's see 
Yep. Okay. So the next step was going into our game controller right here. Next step is cleaning up this code because we're already there and it's messy. Now the next step is going into our game controller and uh, trying to move. So we get a cube if we hit one. Um, and the next thing we need to do is, I don't know, check with our game board and see the state. Yeah, so all right, where are we at here? Sorry. So the game controller has pretty much can you scroll up a little bit there? Yeah, let's here, let's do a, a zoom out real quick first so you can see the entirety of the code. You can double click on the the tab too, it'll it'll make it uh, full screen. Or it'll it'll minimize all the other windows. Get rid of all the other stuff. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, cool. So the game controller, it's doing what we think it should. It's controlling the game here. Sets the board, draws it. We cache a couple of things. Mm -hmm. uh, on enable, we get a new board and we draw the board. And then in update, we're going to do a try move. So I think we need to read something from the game board to see if the position it, or if the current spot or if that spot is open. In fact, I feel like thinking about this more, if we look at our game board, mm -hmm. Um, these two fields that we didn't actually use probably don't belong here. I don't know what you think. The current row and column. Well, all right. So it, the game, when we were showcasing the game earlier, we were playing it. It was, you click and you drag, right? And that's how, that's yeah. how it picks up the thing. Okay. Right. So, yeah, so you click here and you start dragging. And then it lights them up. So let's see if we can get as far as lighting some up. Um, so the simplest case, I'm not quite sure if we're going to need those yet, but uh, let's start with the simplest. Let's see. Let's see if we can just light one up and then go from there. So just do like a GameCube dot become enabled or enable or light up. Oh, no, uh, light, uh, <laughs> oh God. Let's see. What would it be? Enable. I think it's select. become filled because it's supposed to be a fill the line, right? Yeah. But and that is one that is that that's only one representation. While well, I have the microphone in my face, um, <laughs> that that is only one rec. Uh, that's one representation. So what is the fundamentally? What are we doing? We're I mean, we're turning it green. We're turning it green and Before, marking it as it's been filled, like the mark, spot has been used. Okay, okay. I I guess we we'll just call it dot fill. I guess unless that's taken. Ah, probably not. All right. So there we go. So we're gonna fill it. So we do render dot material dot color equals fill color. None of those exist. So let's generate <laughs> uh, alt enter create a field. Call this nice. render or type of render, mm -hmm. and we'll add an awake. Get component renderer. So we're just gonna get that little cube mesh renderer. Um, generate a fill color and we'll make that serialized and set it to green. I've got another uh, writer tip. If you go to the top of your class there, you can type rec, uh, rec comp and that'll be another live template for required component. Oh, a Q, R R E Q. Got it. Oh, okay, nice. Um, <laughs> I do have a video on that if anyone's interested. What's up, Devin? That is nice. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we fill it, we set it to that, and um, it's called clear. Yeah, I like that. Fill and clear. So the important thing so far to note is that right now, all this GameCube class is responsible for doing is just representing that an area is filled. Fundamentally, Nothing's actually happening to our data object. Right. Which and is here fine. I'm just caching the initial color in awake. So we have a clear method that can reset back to whatever that initial color is and not have to have it as a separate field too. It's mm -hmm. easier if the designers can just go in and change it. So we got a fill and a clear. Um, clear is not used yet. And we have an unused system statement. All right. So is that it? That's it, huh? That should allow us to at least hold down and turn the green or turn the cubes green. Let's see. 
Nope. At so what's one. happening? Why is this not working? Let's see. Nothing's happening at all. <laughs> you are our right? game controller. Go back into our game controller and figure out why it's not working. So I don't know what you normally do here, but uh, my default right. is to just draw the ray real quick. Okay. I, I, I would have been logging every step of the way. Probably should have mentioned. Like I would have logged every inch of that code. Four percent of my code is logs. Oh, and then you have to go back and delete all the logs later, though. No, man, I don't delete my logs. Oh, then then they kill your game. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Eventually, they kill things. Okay, so the ray is way the hell off. Um, <laughs> why is it? Okay, let's see. Let's go to the main. It's nowhere near the main camera. Okay, the ray is always at zero zero zero. So there's an issue here. I must have missed something. So you're you're casting a ray from the camera. Or you should keep, just cast it from. Uh, can you cast? Yeah, cast a ray down from your mouse. Yeah, that's yeah. what. Oh wait. Yeah. yeah sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it should be a mouse position. <laughs> You've been working with first person controllers too long, man. <laughs> yeah. So I don't want to shoot down in the center of the screen. I want to shoot down at the mouse position. Ah. Oh, I would have missed that too. I would have sat there for like twenty minutes trying to figure it out on my own. Why is it? Why is it wrong? Just all right. So if we don't want to use the center, there we go. So I can hold and light up all hey of these. The ray isn't going all the way down, by the way. Progress. It's making progress. The power of pair programming. <laughs> Damn yeah. right. It's it's amazing. Add, turn off had, that cube. Turn if on. We got Jason in here. The other Jason, we would uh would be doing extreme programming or mob pro mob programming. Oh, I know. I was gonna send him a link too, but I couldn't find him on Google Chat. Look, I send him guys, a Zoom Give link me a and... week. I'll figure out how to get OBS working, and all three of us will be in here. Going if crazy. you want, just uh, if you got him on Google Chat, just send him the the Zoom link and hop right in. To give me a chance to run to the bathroom. Let me ask him <laughs> Get another this. drink. Jason, you want to hop in the call real quick? So just uh, shoot. I'll send a, a link just in we case. Can send you the invite link. And keep going over the stuff. So that's working. They're lighting up. Um, I do need to run off to the bathroom real quick, though. And All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna send him a link so that we can. Uh, so Okay, cool. We'll so take like 30 second or like two minute break real quick and i don't know if charles wants to just answer questions i'll answer some questions charles answer questions i'll be right back this is perfect i love I'll it my best. <laughs> <laughs> You're like hey go to the bathroom now see any questions can someone oh all right so the the game we're making right now i keep forgetting what it's called shoot i think it's called line filler let me look it up oh it's called phil fill line i'll drop a link in the uh in the chat there we need more charles as well oh that's very nice thank you there can only be one charles i think jason's gonna hop on soon so that'll be cool i'm thinking about doing a stream uh i guess once a week now we're now i've been doing it with jason this is the second week so hopefully we can do this again and hopefully I can show you that that uh, inventory that I was working on. So, Charles, what is your favorite green? Um, probably, I'd say forest green, you know, because it's all natural. And I like the forest. In fact, I just moved in near the forest. Uh, <laughs> what's the idea of the game? So, basically... Um, there's some squares there's a game board and there are certain you know you can think of a game board made up of a, a grid of squares and uh so you click on a one and it'll light up the square and as you move the mouse around the game board it'll start filling up the the squares um it's a terrible explanation but i'm just going to keep going there are some spots on the game board that you cannot fill up uh they're like i guess i don't know they're like blocked and so the idea is you want to fill up the entire game board by moving your mouse over the squares, but you can't cross over your, your previous path. So I don't know. Hopefully we'll finish it and then you'll be able to see it in action. <laughs> uh, have I been shadow banned? Question regarding ECS. No, you haven't been shadow banned. I'm sorry. I missed your question. 
Regarding ECS, for a mid-sized RPG game, do you recommend ECS or not? Uh, I mean, if performance is a re- you're taking a real big hit on performance due to you know having a lot of uh, concurrent operations or a lot of data moving around in your RPG, maybe you've got a lot of things you're managing, like a weather system and you know, with dialogue system and there's like all these things that are happening all the time while your player moves throughout the world, then yeah, I mean, I think ECS would be valuable. Um, but yeah, you don't want to put the cart before the horse. Uh, you don't want to leverage and get locked into something like ECS um, if you don't, really don't need it. But I mean, I've always liked ECS. Obviously, I did a whole series on it. So I mean, if, uh, if it's something that you think will be pretty data intensive, then yeah, I think uh, go for it. You you could definitely leverage ECS. What else, Charles? Please lure Jason over to the dark theme before my eyes burn out from all this white. <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> looks like he's I back. already use. I'm using the dark theme in Unity. I when I use dark theme, my eyes burn out because like I like to have my room super brightly lit. In fact, it kind of drives me nuts how dark it is right now. So <laughs> be tough. I've tried. You know what's funny about the light theme, though? I've actually heard that it isn't necessarily true that the dark theme is better for your eyes. I've actually heard, I've actually heard that light theme is, is technically easier to read. Something yeah. about contrast. Yeah, my eyes are super, super sensitive. Like, uh, I'm deaf as hell, but I can't hear anything, but I can see really well. And my eyes, like, they get overly... They get overwhelmed if it's dark and anything bright pops up. Like, if I use a dark theme... It's fine if the text is relatively dark too, but as soon as something's bright and shines, like it just kills me. And, and then I got you know all the monitors around me, so like the darkness and the brightness, it's it's too much. Um, I totally understand that. I have a lot of friends who just love dark theme for some reason. I hate it. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cool. Um, was there anything else, or should we just get back? I don't know if you were in the no, middle no, of answering the, other. No, questions. we're good. There was a couple of questions. I, want, I think I got them all. Okay, cool. Well, let me check. Actually, let me check my chat. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I'm neglecting my own chat. Oh, we, it's terrible. See, <laughs> By the way, we're at 99 likes. Anybody want to see lucky number 200? Oh. Wait, hold on a second. You're oh. at 100. I'm only at 23. Come on, guys. Uh, can, can, can you spare, spare a like? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, let me see what I got on my side. Uh, okay. In case anyone's curious, I think, hey, other Jason's on. <laughs> Hey, other Jason. Welcome. I wanted to create my own logger that uses conditional attributes, but I realized I needed to make some symbol manager. Yeah. It's always the other chats. I'm not hearing triplicates. Oh, boy. (laughs) It's always fun. Will real-time spotlights always put put the FPS to impractical lower values? You know, I'm not really a big expert on lighting. But yeah, I know with real time, yeah, with real time lighting, I don't, they're switching from enlightened. So I, I don't think they've worked out real time lighting yet with uh, like the new HDRP. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. It's less of a programmy question. Uh, nothing here now. Uh, I still barely use HDRP stuff yet. Um, just because I don't have any real, pro- the real projects that I have that are big, um, they were already in development and it, they're probably not switching. So. Got it. It's something I'd only use in small experiments, really. Gotcha. Well, what I can say about that is that uh, <laughs> real-time lighting, yeah, I think they haven't worked it out yet. Hell yeah, man. 23 watching, and I got 27 likes. Nice. Thanks, guys. <laughs> that's a, that's wow. a heck of a ratio. We're 87 away from 200 now. <laughs> yeah. We'll get there by the end, I think. Uh, um, thanks, guys. You're awesome. So I guess if we get back to the – by the way, I have like about 45 minutes left, maybe an hour. Um then we can do this again of course but heck yeah our, weekly I, if we can muster it i'll be down yeah, yeah it'd be fun i think th- these are a lot of fun um but i was thinking what we need to do is make it so that these reset real quick um like when i release just do like a game board reset that makes sense yeah and then we can go into the logic of whether or not a thing should light up so we'll need to keep track of when you press down and when you let go yeah, Jason, can you see my screen share and Zoom? By the way, you should uh, yeah, have, have the, the updated I'm, version. So I, I think everybody else is like ten seconds behind or something. 
Yeah, I'm just moving windows so I can simultaneously see the chats and also the code. Oh, and fine. Yeah, it's else. fine. Having lots of that's what yeah. I mean, many I monitors, so many, <laughs> so many tabs, so many chats. People ask me why I have so many monitors. No, I need more. God, if I'm going to start doing this more often, I'm going to have to pull out one of the old monitors. I, I switched to um, one ultra wide a while ago. It seems to be the best for coding, just one giant ultra wide monitor. But I've got like three in boxes in various corners of my office that I can set up if I need to have a chat dedicated view. Yeah, you know, I find looking left to right is more difficult than looking up and down. What do you guys think about that? Sorry to go off topic. I never look at that monitor over there. <laughs> I look at these two and then that one just uh, plays videos and like has the crap that I can't look at because yeah, it's too far to look like just just going left to right. I, I think I've tried every variation of monitors at some point. I remember uh, a while ago there was um, the iFinity line of graphics cards. And they had um, the micro display ports. So you could have up to six monitors plugged into a single <laughs> graphics card. Holy hell. And uh, I, I had to set up a nice six monitor display. And it was just insanity. It's just too many screens. It's annoying <laughs> all the bezels. So I eventually ended up switching to dual monitor. And that was great. But um, I didn't like the bezel down the center. And mm -hmm. I switched to three monitors. And I found that despite three monitors, I, what I would keep doing is I would keep dragging windows from the sides into the center when I wanted to deal with them. It was almost like I had one single focus point and the rest was just arbitrary. So I realized the points of the second monitor are not to be work monitors, they're to be display monitors. Mm. So I ended up switching those to being um, vertical displays. And that way you can have them as strips for chats and things like that. And I, I would use it for Skypes and I would use it for uh, mood boards or for things I was working on. Or alternatively, you'd have it for um, your to-do list. If you're doing like uh, mm. agile boards or something, you'd use the boards on one screen. But after all of that, I ended up realizing that I... I just prefer one giant monitor. It just saves a lot of messing and yeah. So I've, I've done the whole rounds. Yeah, I'm, I'm still in the, I'm not sure what I want to do. I, I'm in the process of maybe stacking my two 4K monitors and then getting one long one to, to put vertical for like code or discord or whatever. But uh, yeah, I just, I, maybe I just need to get rid of this bezel because I think I would drag windows right in front of me if I didn't have the bezel there. I don't know. I just use three. Three monitors that match, <laughs> lined up in a row. Uh, it's an interesting one. Do you guys use Stream Decks? Yeah, oh yeah, I've got my Stream Deck. Oh yeah, man. I, I mainly <laughs> use it to switch my lights between white mode and different sets of colors, though. That's freaking awesome. <laughs> yeah. else. And I use it to switch my speakers from headphones to from my DAC to my normal speakers. So yeah, it's pretty much I only use it for random stuff like that too. That's all the things Some that were, or I would want a button and need a web page or something. So. Um, okay, I was adding the reset stuff here. So <clears throat> if we do a reset on release, um, should we, uh, I'm not sure what we should do. Because right now there are two things going on, right? The um, the GameCube doesn't actually do anything. Like we call fill. Actually, where is this called from again? We call the fill, but we should probably set something in the game board. Um, yeah, to keep, I mean, because the game board is the underlying data structure. Actually, you know what we should do is make in the releasing, we should reset the game board like that, right? Some sort of a reset. And then I think, um, I, I don't know how they implement that yet, but I think then, actually I do. I'll just go through and zero them all out, I think. But the other thing we need to do is call into the view and tell it to redraw the game board, right? Or to refresh the game board. So instead of... Uh... Or should we make the board... I mean, I see what you're saying. I mean, I th it feels a little expensive, but yeah, I mean, instead of having to keep track of every lit cube and saying, okay, let me go back and, un uh, you know, unfill these or whatever, you're just saying, screw it. Let's just wipe it out. Well, we could just it. reset them. I, doing a draw is probably bad. <laughs> we probably do like an update, but I was, then I was thinking maybe the game board view should just know that the board got, or that a position changed or a thing changed in there and get reset. But I don't know if it necessarily needs to. You can call... Um... When you do draw a game board on the like the game board viewed can just keep track of all the game cubes, like uh, have a list of game cubes that it creates, and then when you call reset on the game board view, it could just loop just update and, them all to the correct state. Just hit empty, yeah. Dot empty. That's not a bad idea. So if we keep like a a list of those, what if we do it like that? Or an array, <laughs> right? And just make uh, a match. 
I would just personally at this point, since that doesn't really matter, I don't really care where they are. I mean, maybe it does matter, but it just feels like duplication of logic. I might just make it a list and just loop through them. But hey, whatever, it doesn't matter. You're already doing them. Yeah. Kind of map them one to one. I don't know. I like it. Do it. Looking good. So now, so now you just populate the. uh... Yep. Yeah, make it that with gameboard.columns. Gameboard.rows, and then we just set. That, right? Yeah. So that gives us all of the cubes, and then we can add a refresh. Or I really feel like we should just get a callback when something changes on the game board. Hmm. I don't know. Well, let's just do an, a refresh. This is really like the draw, so just loop through. I mean, I would say you've got a pretty solid boundary as it is. The game board doesn't really know about, you know, the game cubes or the game view, so oh. you know, you're good. I, right I now. still think that they, I would have, I would have had some intermediary. I find that the view is a visual representation of your data model, and your data object is your kind of is the board itself. It seems to me that we're now deciding what renders in the view relative to the data in the model. Mm -hmm. that we're basically leaning into because this is event driven as opposed to uh, an update loop. We've basically got our own little MVC model here. Now, normally I think we've all ranted before how you don't really want to use MVC in Unity as a given because it's not really what it's built for, but MVC is built around event driven architecture. And this is pretty much what we're doing. We have a, a model which consists of a bunch of data fields and we have a view that's how we're drawing it. It strikes me if we're making decisions about when things should clear or refresh, there should be something like a board controller, which would take in a view, take it a, a board, and then draw that board to that view. And that way the controller can decide what logic applies and we can swap out the view relative to the keeping the same board and controller. Yes, yeah, I like that approach too, because right now we are pretty much, uh, we're going all in on the whole cube thing, as opposed to you know making it something that we could swap out later with a different, uh, a different representation. There's a reason for that though. Because we're never going to swap it out. <laughs> <laughs> there is that. There is that. Yeah. Hey, if we're being realistic, yeah, like, yeah, we, we could definitely engineer the hell out of it, but we're never going to do it. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll concede. The game board view is our kind of our universal, our game, rend game board renderer, I guess, is the entire, it encompasses the whole process. Yeah, I think if we were, if we were looking at something bigger, more complex, where we actually had a, a use case for swapping it out, it would make sense. I mean, we're doing uh, something simple. Oh man, I love over engineering. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I get, get that. So I was thinking here, instead of a fill and clear, we should just have this be like a toggle state. So you can okay. just pass in the true or false, and then we can pass in the bool from the GameCube. Make right. this like a toggle, like that, and we just do like if it's on, we do the fill color. Otherwise, the initial color. We can swap this down, make this nice and tiny too. Well, if, if this is the angle we're going then, I think uh, Jason was right when he was saying maybe it's a good idea for us to perform actions on the board, like clear, and that dispatches an event that the view can look at and then perform the clear as well. Mm. So maybe we just have some uh, board changed event and then the view would just subscribe and perform changes relative to the data change. Just lean in on it. I was thinking the same thing. The only issue I wasn't sure on was... Um, yeah, actually, no, that makes sense. Because initially I was thinking there was going to be controlling things from the view. But I think that, yeah, what you're saying there makes sense. So the idea is just that um, on the game board, we send some sort of an update or an event whenever a thing changes, right? Like when, whenever the state of a thing changes. Um, so let's see. Let's make the GameCube do this. So GameCube, um, this is a problem. Let's see. Okay, well, we can get the position of it. So let's do that. We'll get the column in position and then set it on the game board. Mm -hmm. Dot set, or let's say toggle, and we give it gamecube dot column comma gamecube dot row comma true. Is there ever a case when we set something to false on here? No. So I'll just do fill, because the only other time is we reset, right? No, we can undo. If we release, or if we go back over things, it undoes. So let's do toggle. 
So make a toggle method here. Yeah. Um, and then we just set positions at that thing. Equal to on. And then we fire off an event. So this is this is the fun part. So yeah. you're like a public event action int comma int comma bool. Um, position changed or I don't know. What do you want to name it? Does it seem <laughs> right to you guys? I was thinking this would be column row state. We just register for that I, on the view. I usually go with the, the standard uh, event syntax of naming it an action verb. And then you'd have your internal say changed and then on changed would be the uh, internal on, like uh, on cube changed well I, I would have changed be the event you subscribe to and then i would have a protected unchanged function inside of this class that we call wherever we need to fire a change event because the game the game board is the thing that changed in the end of the day so i think you're safe to just call that like yeah because you're literally saying board dot changed and that's the, that's the thing you're subscribing to so it's, it's kind of baked into the name change, got it invoke more like this but you just wrap them in a method yeah because they, well, I guess it's not as relevant these days, but it, it was mostly to do with um, uh, with the risk of not locking. So you'd need to have mm -hmm. a, um, you need to cache your event just just prior to invoking it. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, so if we re if we make the event here, we fire it off there. Um, oh, and then here, I guess in reset board, we just do a loop through all of them. Um, there's that little loop. I really don't like copying that, but <laughs> really what we got to do is just go toggle. Get rid of those and those, and that should just turn them all off and fire off the event for all of them, right? Mm -hmm. So we got a reset, we've got a toggle, um, and then in the game board view, when we draw, we're really binding. So just because we're gonna register an event, I'm gonna rename it. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go like, uh, if game board is not equal to null, we need to deregister. So do game board dot changed minus equals handle game board changed. And we'll generate the method for it. And the reason for that is because right after this, we want to do game board dot changed plus equals handle game board change. So we just want to re remove the registration if it, if we change boards so that the old board isn't still linked. And then this is column row and on. Okay. So we're almost there. So we do handle game board changed. So here's where you'd call your gamecube.fill. Yes. Cubes.column comma row dot toggle on. Is that it? Then we don't need a refresh, right? Well, you might, uh, because you have that reset in your game board, you might have an event. That's just going to call this anyway, though. I mean, we could optimize it so it doesn't fire off an event for each one, but I don't think I care at this point. Is it firing? Uh, on game yeah, board? well, I mean, it's going to fire yeah, off oh, the I event when we do a reset, but that's... I understand, because you're going you're gonna to roll through each one and hit toggle on each one. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Like, uh, again, if it was something we were doing common, like hmm. often in an update or more than you know a dozen of them, maybe I'd yeah. care, but... I think here it'll be okay. Um, are we missing anything to make this work? I should be able to draw now and release and see what errors we get. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's something. There's got to be something missing. There's errors. There's, there's are we never going? a case where I just coded it all and I didn't miss some line of code somewhere. At least it's rarely a case, unless I'm writing tests and running the tests first. Okay, so there we go. I can draw if I release. <gasps> Magic. <laughs> Look at that. It's beautiful. It actually works. 
Uh, one of the questions I saw there was um, null checking every frame. Is there much overhead to worry about? Not really. It doesn't really affect you that much. Uh, as you start to get to more advanced stuff, you might want to favor a uh, null object pattern in certain cases mm -hmm. where you can strip out some of the null checks. Or if you use uh, defensive programming, as Charles mentioned earlier, you try to exit out earlier. So what you can do is it, you still have to do the null checks, but what you can do is you can structure your null checks such that it does the cheapest one first and it ignores the others, so it doesn't have to do it. If you incorrectly structure them, you can end up with a case where it does three failed checks before it moves on. So there's a couple of things you can do to optimize it, but fundamentally, not really. Like you don't really have to worry about null unless it's unless you're doing like 50 null checks in an update in for no reason, and in which case you can probably find a way to wrap that in some other object and then have a single null check that equates to the same thing. So it's usually not an issue. And even then, you're not going to notice. Anything. Yeah, yeah even, like, <laughs> you, you, could, you could have hundreds of thousands of them, and it's still because realistically, right? People don't notice this, but if you start, if you if you do the whole F12 thing and and dig down across all the different layers that are in built into unity and even in um even in just standard c sharp if you're looking at things like um how strings are validated or how the any of the two string functions or all of those those sort of um number formatting functions if you if you f12 down through them you'll see there's an awful lot of null checks that are going on that you don't even think about there's already layers upon layers of null checking that's just existing so yeah it's just a nature of of how code works unfortunately <laughs> Yeah, and it's not it's not slow though. That's the main thing. Like if you're worried about it for performance, don't. In fact, I'd say generally, if you're worried about things for performance, profile because usually when people guess what the problem is, they're wrong. They it's yeah. very very rare that people guess the right problem. Even people who've been debugging and doing performance optimizations for a long time like guess stuff wrong all the time. Like and if you haven't done it a lot, you're almost I would say guaranteed to be guessing at the wrong things and fixing the wrong issues. Profiler will tell you exactly where the problem is, what line it is, how much time it's taking and how to, you know, get a good idea of how to fix it. And, and another way to put it as well is the cost of throwing a null, no matter how bad it is, it will never be as bad as a null firing in your update <laughs> consistently in an update frame. <laughs> So realistically, there is no, it's not even worth the question of, of should I avoid null checks? It's more a case of you put the null checks in, providing it makes sense for your code. And, you know, it's it's always better than the alternative. Because if, if you do any kind of, because people don't realize what an exception is. An exception is full on breaking the flow of execution. It's not just a wrong path. It is completely breaking how the code is, is running. So you really want to avoid actually throwing exceptions far more than you should care about any kind of uh, null checks. Totally agree. Um, somebody asked about releasing the video. Uh, it'll be up after this. Uh, it, they automatically go up and then we'll do a, an edited version later. And then um, somebody was asking about the the array. I don't know if any of you guys, either you guys want to explain it. The double array or the uh, jagged array. Oh, the multi-dimensional. Your multi-dimensional, yeah. So um, allowing us to have- it's, 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 I could take it, Charles, I don't mind. All right, go for it. <laughs> go for it, yeah. Um, <laughs> Right, so when people think of an array, array is just a fancy word for a list, right? And in, in sort of programming terms, there's various reasons as to why it's an array as opposed to a list, but that's not really relevant. The important thing to remember is it's just synchronous data. It's just A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four. That's all it is. And so when people start talking about multi-dimensional arrays, that is just two, two dimensions. And it's the same way we have 2D versus 3D, it's just an extra dimension. So another way to put it is you have A, B, C, D or A, B, C, D and one, two, three, four. So a two-dimensional array lets you work on two axes. So it lets you have things. It's perfectly designed for working with grids because it's literally displaying data in two different sets. And you can keep adding them. There's actually, you can have multi-dimensional arrays that are mostly infinite, but if you're going past three, you're probably in dangerous territory and shouldn't be doing it. But up to three-dimensional is probably about okay. Um, and the, the reason we do it that way is because uh, it, at the core of how it works, a two-dimensional array is just an array of arrays. So put another way, a list of lists. So it's a list of 10 elements and each element is another list. But the problem is, if you do that, you've got a number of issues. For example, each list can be different sizes relative to the other list. So you could have a list with it staggered. And that's gonna be really difficult when doing a lot of complicated stuff to do with array indexes. In most cases, when you're doing 2 these arrays, you're doing them for a grid. So long story short, a multi-dimensional array lets you define a list of lists whereby you set a size on both axes. And that way you can work with it quite easily and it saves a lot of hassle. So that's that's the TLDR. 
That's a good explanation. Yeah, usually when I see them used, it's for things like 2D grids or 3D grids. It's where we usually use <laughs> most of the time because things where you always want the same X and Y or X and Y and Z. Um, and I've, I don't think I've ever seen one that went above three, like you yeah. were mentioning. And that's um, the other thing too. Someone made a good point. Uh, the interesting thing about arrays too is that the way arrays work is kind of clever insofar as... Um, there's actually a really simple equation. It's just a, a very simple math equation that converts a single array into a 2D array. And it's basically just taking the iterative size of each chunk and dividing it out. And you can effectively turn a single array into a 2D array in terms of just having the right index counts. So it's more efficient to store memory um, contiguously in a chunk together. So a lot of the times what happens is a 2D array is actually in memory, just a chunk of sequential data but there's a special way in which you ask that data how to get an index out from two indexes. So it's, it's kind of like um, some of the other code you would have seen, which is sort of divide by the width of number of elements and get the one at this index. It's not that complicated. It is a little bit hard to explain without visual aid, but effectively it comes down to, it's more efficient in memory to store a single contiguous chunk. And the difference between literally making an array of arrays like we did at the very beginning, we were confused about the double boxes versus an actual uh, multi-dimensional array is it'll store it contiguously as one chunk. So it's far more efficient, even though it's technically from a using standpoint, exactly the same thing. Yeah, that's a great explanation. Somebody asked what we were building. Uh, we're just building this level game or this line thing. Um, we'll get back to that in just a minute too, but it's basically this where you fill it in and you can, yeah, beat the level. And we've got that kind of done. Um, well, we don't have the part where you can beat it done yet. So we'll have to do that next. Um, and then I think there were a couple other questions too. Let's see. Um, oh, somebody asked about the mastery course. Is it for beginners? Kind of. It starts off beginner friendly, but it gets into more advanced stuff. Um, so if you're a beginner, it's an okay place to start, I think. Um, I got an architecture course that's definitely not that's coming out soon. Um, but if you're looking to start, yeah, it's, a, it's a good place for beginners. If it doesn't work, let me know. Or if it doesn't work for you well, let me know. But I think it should be good. Uh, and somebody asked about Dootween. Um, I used to use Dootween all the time when I first started using Unity. I don't know about you guys. Did oh, you guys? Yeah, I've, used it. I've used it. Like I relied on it heavily, and then I found that I stopped using it. Like, I'm a dummy. I call. I used to call it Dot Tween. Oh yeah, <laughs> Dot. Tween. Don't you remember Hot Tween? That's what it used to be before yes. all of that. Yes, <laughs> I do remember Hot Tween <laughs> or Ho Tween. Oh, yeah. I don't know what it is. I don't know. Um, I don't. I don't use it anymore. But I used to use it a lot for moving things around. Now I tend to use animations or very specific code for things. Um, what about you, Jason? You still use Dootween? Oh yeah, all the time. <laughs> it's like oh, okay. honestly, it, it makes its way into about I'd say three quarters of my project because a lot of the work I do is um, sort of prototype vertical slice stuff for clients. So there's a lot of sort of swishy animations and stuff that goes into that. And, that makes uh, sense. We do. Have, you use it with Doozy too, right? Uh, I do, although I don't like what they've done with the redesign, so I've stopped using Doozy these days. I found oh. a different framework I use instead. They've gone sort of for a um, what you see is what you get visual editor, and it just seems like a lot of overhead for what amounts to you know managing the state of a few uh, panels. But um, but on for the tweening thing. So for people who don't know, um, tweening is just a kind of a, a more animated term for interpolation. And so you've got linear interpolation, which is sort of moving a thing from from time from one position to another over time. And so the idea being, if you've got a number at two and a number at four, at time 0 0.5, halfway between one to the other, it'll it'll you know be in the middle. So effectively, uh, tweening is just one way to animate things. And it literally is just a case of adding a percentage of a value to the other value until it reaches the end. So it's not that complicated. Um, in fact, I have a, a blog post on that very topic, which I'll, I'll link in a second. Um, and so, the, the, the reason we're questioning is, do we use this? Well, you can do the same thing with animations. And an animation is a timeline. That's the difference. An animation is sort of, it runs an entire uh, sequence of things and you can stack things up at their positions in time. While tweening libraries are just third party libraries that do the same kind of thing, but are sort of designed for a smaller scope. They don't sort of encompass the whole project. Uh, I personally like to use tweening libraries because they handle, um, there's something you can program easier than animation. Animation is great if you're doing cutscene stuff or you're actually animating a character with multiple blending. But if you're just saying bouncing, uh, sliding an object in the screen, uh, tweening is easier. Um, if you're if you're comfortable programming, of course, it's, it's obviously easier to animate it if you're happier in Unity. But more so than that, the advantage it has is 
uh, as I mentioned in the chat earlier, is if you use animations on UI components in Unity, you are forcing a refresh constantly. So in the entire life cycle of that object, even when it's idle, um, the way animators work is they're constantly pinging their position in time because they're doing it across all of the different items. So if you've got an idle animator in an idle state where something is positioned at zero, it's still animating. Even if you don't see it, it's just animating all of the time to the position of zero. If you do a tween, it's event-based. So it only fires the time you use it, um, which can be more efficient. It's, it's, not, it's not, again, it's like the whole if null thing. It's not that big of a deal. It's not going to end your project. But if you've got a giant hierarchy and your project grows, you might hit a slowdown later and you'll question why it's happening. And it could be because you've got a big animation running at the top of your hierarchy route for a canvas, depending on how you've designed it. Uh, yeah, so long story short again, uh, <laughs> tweening is great. I use tweening a lot. Uh, do tween is my personal favorite. I tween is great, although the syntax uses a hash map, which can be confusing for people. So I usually recommend do tween. Nice. Yeah, I just, like I said, I used it a ton at the beginning and then um, I stopped running into cases where it was as useful. Um, and, and I'd run into random problems, importing it into different projects and stuff. Um, so. It's interesting to know how much more you use it though. Yeah, yeah, and in fact, is even when I don't want to use external libraries, because that happens too. Sometimes you have a project where you're handing it off to somebody else or you, you don't have people have to rely on a bunch of libraries. You can actually find single file tweening libraries. There's a really nice one somewhere. I don't know where I have it. I have a, a the, the accredited to as well on the top of it. It's someone has just basically taken a 800 lines of code and just squashed the common tweening functions into one file. And it's just a really nice way of just basically saying ease in, ease out, you know, use the fundamentals of uh, bounce in and bounce out. And it's all just one file. You can drop into a project. You don't have to add any assets. So oh, nice. very handy for that. I'll, I'll send you a link to that. After yeah, you get a link. Go drop it on the description. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so I want to fix the next issue in this thing. So um, when we left off, like we can draw a level and it fills in and stuff, but there's still some things that we can do. We shouldn't be able to do like, we can go back here and then come back down and draw and fill the things in. Like we need to only be able to fill in the adjacent squares. So I figured that would be like a next um, fun, easy thing to do. Right, we just do it. So to do that, I guess my thought was in this try move to new cube, it's called try because it's like it should fail sometimes. Um, <laughs> do we just do a check here to see if this game cube is valid? So once we've raycasted and figured out the cube, just check to see if that cube is valid is a valid option with the game board right so you say like game board dot is valid or, or do like some validation checker that just checks to see um if the point is valid yeah i mean on the game board itself that'd be pretty easy because you just check if it's already true then you obviously you know it's it's not valid but another thing to consider is what valid also needs to take into effect uh, into account the previous yeah cube so that see i don't know if that's a job for the game board though i mean i think the game board does need to tell you if it's valid based on the whole true or false but it seems like the the game controller is the one who can decide it should do it yeah i mean I, maybe, maybe the game board has information about how this game is played it is called a game board but i feel like the game controller should be in, in you know in charge of saying hey look based on the I'm keeping track of the last cube you touched. So based on that last cube, I can tell you whether or not this next one is actually valid. That makes sense. So to do that, we would just check. I'm, I'm thinking that the game controller should keep track of the previous, the previous uh, cube at all times. Oh, the previous cube or the previous position? Whatever the whatever the the previous one that was lit up, because then it would know. I mean, I almost feel like because I was I was actually playing it in the browser, and it looks like it keeps track of the whole line. So maybe you need to have like a like a stack. What would it use the line for, though? Well, I noticed that when um when you go over, like if you're playing the game, when you start going over um the multiple cubes, when you go back over them it unfills them yeah one you're, by you're one. basically saying it's got a command pattern i can see i saw that myself it's, it sort of has an undo redo relative like you if yeah. you moved one direction and go back it won't let you move until you've undone the reverse of what you've done by moving back through the steps 
That's a good I mean, point. I don't think we need, I don't know if we need to implement that. That seems like an extra feature from the original requirement, but we could, yeah. The idea being that for each move you make, we store a stacked position of each of those. And then as you move, if it's, if it's an invalid new position, we just unpop the previous stack if you're moving back onto it. I mean, we could do that. Yeah, we, we, we don't have to go that ham. We, we could just keep, I still think we need to keep track of the, the, the current cube, I guess, because you feel- I don't think there's any yeah. harm in just keeping track of all of them. Mm -hmm. It's not going to get more complicated, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the only thing I don't like about it is that I got a reference to um, GameCube is in here. Um, but I don't think it matters. What's missing? Oh. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah, just because it's referencing the, the object that we're really using for the view, but I, I think it's okay. The other option would be like make a struct or an int in positions or something but I just keep the cubes here well i mean the game cube the game board itself could keep track of the order like the positions that were filled and in, in what order because you figure look the game board gets filled and we you know we call we change its state so it, technically internally it could keep track of the order in which its state was changed again i'm probably over engineering on this in the game board yeah that's like <laughs> Interesting. Um, but well, let's not let's not overcomplicate it. I guess the easiest thing to check is, hey, can I refill the same one, or or whatever? Or can I fill this next one? I guess. Can I fill this ne this next one? Yeah. Yeah. We'll do that for let's now. Let's start with that. I don't want right. to go too. So we need a current column. Wait, we have these on somewhere else, right? And weren't they in the wrong spot before on the game board? Mm -hmm. Oh. Our own column, yeah. And we're talking about moving them to the game controller here, and then these could probably be private. I can't think of a reason they would be exposed. Um, so when we set the cube, oh wait, is valid cube. Um, By the way, you got like a super chat. Oh. Super cat question. Wait, let's check that out. In future videos, can you show us when it might be useful to use a cert function in our code? Heard it's a great example of defensive coding. Um, yeah, I rarely use asserts in actual game code um, because it's just going to kill the thing. It's going to shut it down or throw throw an except. Like you're going to end execution. Um, I use them in the unit tests instead, but. I see what you're saying. I used to see that a lot in a lot of C++ games where if things went really, really bad um, on the server, like it would be bad, so it would just kill the whole process. But I almost never use asserts in actual game code anymore. I don't Do you guys ever? I, I mean, like you said, I only use them in unit tests. In tests. I know that the assert, the Unity engine has an assertions library that... Uh... I haven't really used it. Yeah, I used to use it in Unreal, and we'd basically use it to kill the server if something went terribly wrong. Um, well, I'm I'm actually on the um, the documentation here, and it seems like uh, I don't know. I, I don't know if there's some sort of built-in functionality with Unity where if you use their assertion library, it'll do something special that, like, because I see here it says an assert an assertion exception will be thrown in order to pause the execution and invoke the debugger. So I don't know if that's a way. A, a unity specific way to be like hey look i'm not going to kill the program but if you're debugging inside of unity it'll pause it there like maybe it does something like that Th that i'm not really sure though i'm not 100 percent. yeah no me neither um because my my history came from c sharp sort of line of business software as opposed to games <clears throat> the assert is used there almost exclusively inside of tests the same as jason was saying um because it does it, it basically breaks execution but Here's a little bit of story time relative to this idea. If we're talking about defensive programming, um, basically there's a bit of a war on the concept of exception handling. So as, as people who are catching up with, with the latest versions of C Sharp and stuff, there's a major push now to have your code um, work in such a way where you have to define which variables are nullable. Long story short, it's gonna make it so that you can't have things which aren't null, like even your strings can't be null um, and everything has to have a value. Uh, unless you define specifically that it can be null. And the reason they're doing this is because this is the latest take on the idea of nulls break code. Nulls fundamentally are 
they're not even a, a bad object. They are the active missing portion of something that's being ferried through your application. They are a problem where somebody will have to handle it. Either you're handling it at one place or you're just passing the null down the chain until mm -hmm. somebody handles it. Null by definition is a mistake. It is a thing in your code which is not there, but it should have been there. Um, and there's been a whole load of different ways to handle this. The, the old way from Java is to use try catch blocks. It's you basically the giant try catch block and you say, if this breaks, catch it, dump it to an exception handler and then run a specific piece of code to handle when this happens. The next step up from that is the idea of people saying code defensively. Don't let your code ever run in an invalid state. And that basically says the first guy who gets a null handles the null and cuts it off there. And what you do is you decide, is this null game breaking or can I recover from it? If I can recover from it, I run as if there was no null and I keep going. If it's game breaking, cancel my app and break it from there. That way I can go out, that way you don't end up with data in inconsistent state. Like you don't want someone's user account missing an email or missing an account balance or something because that's fundamentally going to break your application. After that, there was this whole phase in the middle which people may have forgotten. And it was this, this idea of called um, code contracts or designed by contract. Mm -hmm. And it's where it's the same as the as we've done here. If this is null or if this is false, break out of the application. Code contracts were a way of saying, this code will need this data to look like this before you even continue. And it's a more formalized version, but it failed to take off because it takes four or five lines of code to define what is effectively, this should be null or this cannot be null. And it's, it's a horrible mess of code to write that really ruins the kind of readability of your code. So that brings us all the way to today and how we're handling it is, well, let's not write null logic at all. Let's try to avoid it. And the way you avoid it is one of two main ways. You either make placeholders where null might have been, and that's where the null object pattern is worth looking into. It's basically make a version of the thing that you want that has zero implementation. And you notice, you also notice that Jason does something similar. Uh, at least I think it's you who does it, who writes your events where you assign a default delegate to your events beforehand. Yeah, I used to do that all the time. Now I use the question mark dot instead. Yeah, I so just I never think, invoke without it. Exactly, and it boils down to the same reason, which is you don't want to be dealing with null throughout your code. If you can find a way to assign even a default value to something, it's better than having a null value. Because again, null value is broken. It's not just a lack of a value. Um, and so that's where we are now. We're basically dealing with how do we get rid of nulls in our code? And we're coming down to the fact that let's just not have nulls at all. That's sort of the general consensus and people are moving in that direction. So it's, it's a messy topic in terms of how do you handle nulls in code in general? It's interesting though, because I use nullable um, primitives all the time now. Like it's mm. a, especially for data that is optional. I have lots of optional data in, in some stuff and use nullable uh, primitives for a ton of things there. In the case where it, it could have this thing, it could not, it's 100% optional. Um, yeah. And, and, and they're mapping to a database, of course, too, where they're null. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I use okay. a lot for uh, binding from models from a web API. Like if you're calling an API service and you're getting back a JSON object, you're going to need nullable objects to represent those. And as a small aside, if anyone's familiar with JavaScript as well as C Sharp, it's, the name for that is actually an option. There's, there's another design pattern, specifically more familiar in, in JavaScript, called the option pattern. And that's the same thing as the nullable object in C Sharp. It's basically a thing. It's, it's like a container of one element, and it either has an element in it or it doesn't. So instead of passing a null around your code, you say it's, either, it's an object that's either empty or it's a list with one item in it. And it's a much cleaner way of using your code because then nothing ever breaks. It's just a empty list. So it's, it's a bit weird syntactically, but it fundamentally is a much nicer way to handle it than letting a null propagate through your code. Um, so I think this might be all we need. Uh, I was just looking at the code. I don't know if you guys have been watching the code. All I did was add the is valid cube thing here, add a git that just wraps those positions. It's just pulling back the positions. And if the state is true, so it's already on, we should return false. Um, The other you thing we need to check not. is that the distance from this, the current cube to that cube is um, just one unit, right? Right. Um, and we could do that with just the columns and rows. So, well, here, first, let's see. So if we set a valid cube, we'll toggle it and we'll set the current cube, current column to column and the current row do the game cubes row. And then um, here we can just check if um, 
Let's see, how do we check? How do you guys want to check this? So at this point, we just need to check that the column is one different and the row is the same, or the row is the same and the column is one different. That's really all we have to check, right? It's or like, oh yeah. Yeah, so it's either the column equals our current column. Yeah. And row changed by one, then we return true. Right. And then also if the row stays the same and the column changes by one. So we just do like um so you can just do current column take the absolute value of the current column minus the column. Um, and make sure that's equal to one. It'd be the absolute value of this, right? Uh-huh. And then just make sure that that equals one. Or, or like the other way, right? Mm -hmm. Do we even need that absolute? So we well, could just going... do that. I guess it depends on if you you know if you're going up or down or left or right. Like that. That's right, right? So this would be up and down. That's where unit tests come in handy. Mm -hmm. And then we change this to row, row. Hey, Mateo's Oops. here. Does that look right? And obviously not the fact, the cleanest, but if our column has stayed the same and our row has changed by one or negative one, I guess that the math dot absolute would have done that, huh? <laughs> I, don't <know> I, <laughs> I don't want to be the one to say it. <laughs> no, it's good because sometimes it's just. Get it in your head and get get confused. I got you. <laughs> like it's easier when you're not writing the code. Yeah. <laughs> there so there. Math dot absolute, by the way, just turns negative one into one. So if we get negative one or one, um, we'll get it. Absolute is just the, the positive version of the value. Um, I think that's it. So that should tell us if the cube is valid and only let us go to new cubes. So now when we do the selection, we get the cube, check if it's valid, and then only toggle it on and only set our new row if that's the case. And our current column and row, um, here's the problem, right? That's going to start off as zero. Does that mean we can only start on block zero, zero? Here, let me, let me fuck around and show you how I use my nullables. <laughs> oh boy <laughs> if anybody wants to see how to how, how, how to do it with nullables do like this and you dot value and dot yeah, value. value make sure it has a value and then here you just check to see if um if that has value is false or current column dot has value is false return true because Here, they're all valid me. Here's me over. You might want to put a, a exclamation point in front of that after the or. Where? If not, current volume has value. Because you you put a oh yeah. yeah, or or equal false. Double equals false. I only put the double equals false there just because I find like when I'm doing videos, it's super easy for people to miss the yeah it's the fair. symbol there. Like I, I, it's, yeah, I found people miss it all the time, and then. Like if I just do double equals false, very obvious um, when they're copying stuff and looking at it. Uh, and just as a, as a fun side note, because a lot of people don't realize this, here's something if you didn't know, it's pretty cool. Uh, the way Boolean operands work, so on line 67 there, um, what the compiler is going to do is it's going to say, if this value is false, and if it is false, it's just going to move on. It's going to return true. Uh, it will never actually check the second one. The yep. double pipe symbol will only ever check the first one until it fails the validation or succeeds it and then moves on. Uh, if that was a single pipe, it would ensure to validate both claims. That's not very relevant in most cases, but if, if you're just as a pro tip for people who get confused about it, because this does happen, mm -hmm. this is fine because they're fields. They're fields that you're checking. But if you've got a function that returns true or false and you've got it in an if statement and you've got if this or this or this or this, it'll only ever run the first one. It won't actually run the others unless they are single pipes instead of double pipes. 
Just right. something to keep in mind. It comes up very rarely, but it's very worth knowing. <laughs> yeah, and I would say in general, if your function is doing anything other than just returning back true or false, it's probably shouldn't be in an if statement. Um, yeah, it, it tends to be because the problem is people don't expect that, right? Like they look at the code, they expect this thing that's in an if statement to not be running and executing things. And by default, you just assume that it's checking. Um, I've run into that many times. It's pain. <laughs> but yeah, here it's just uh, it, it really this should never get called. Like there's no situation where our code is running where this should get called. But it's good to have as a check in case the code changes. Uh, yeah, let and, me see. And if the this... sort of term for that is side effects. So the idea being that when you read your code, what you see, it should do exactly that. The, 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 as we were saying, is if the code did something else, like it was setting a value in the background, that'll be a side effect. It'd be an unexpected outcome from running that piece of code. So whenever you're naming stuff and you're having trouble deciding what to name it. If it returns a value, call it get. If it's checking something, call it check. I mean, it may sound obvious, but there's a big difference between calling get and in the background, it's setting some value to something else. That is not a get. It is internally changing the state of your object. So make it's sure you represent what it's doing. I'm say I don't use um, properties. So properties, setters and properties, having logic in them that sets things and changes things. Try to avoid those at all costs, like the public properties. Because most of the time, like if you're not familiar with it, you don't remember that one, you're going to think it's just a value that you're setting, not realize that it's calling some code. I mean, I've seen somewhere like you set a variable and it makes a web service request that saves stuff off to the database and people don't know it and they're setting it in a loop. Right? <laughs> it's just like, oh yeah, it's like, it's one of those things where the, the default behavior is innocuous and you don't expect the crazy stuff. Oh, we had another super chat too. So let's answer it real quick. Does it matter if we use MP3s or waves in our game? I have some sound effects that are waves and others that are MP3s. Should they all be one format or OGG? Um, uh, do, do what you like. It doesn't really matter. The only one exception is waves will loop well, MP3s will not. There's a little blip at the end sometimes when you're trying to loop and match an MP3. So as a general rule, I tend to use wave whenever I need something that's uh, going to loop. Um, in fact, I use pretty much wave for everything. Um, although there's no real harm to MP3s. Like it's not... The, the compressions in Unity are sufficiently good that you'll be fine for both. Um, so that's my take anyway. Yeah, I usually go with MP3s just for the um, the project size. It's, oh, unless they're small, short, little things, and they use waves too. But um, uh, I, just, I haven't really run into a problem with audio in a very long time in Unity, though, since like the 3.x days. <laughs> But yeah, I would say just MP3s most of the time, um, or waves if they're small. Like, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Oh, this is working, by the way. So I don't know if you guys saw. It actually oh, nice. did it. It did oh, what we yeah. wanted. So I can start here. I can go left. I can go right. Nothing happens. All the way over here, the only spot that'll work is that bottom left corner. And I can draw all the way around and release. Love it. Beautiful. Look at that. That's great. Um, so I only have like 10 more minutes until we got to... <laughs> give somebody a tour of the house. So I wanted to wrap up with uh, winning the game real quick. I figured like we could just count the number of blocks that are enabled. And if it's all of them, you win. Yeah, that, that's the works. Get the count. <laughs> and I think maybe we want to do an edited version to show how to um, block off levels or maybe do another call next week and just show how to block off cubes and spots on there and stuff. I think that would be a lot of fun too. And it's one of the things that's missing because right now we can, we can define a board of any size and shape, but we can't put obstacles in there. I think that would be good. Um, and really all we have to do is like turn them to true or maybe add a new state that's blocked or just not show a cube there, right? Like that's the easiest thing. Just don't render a cube. In fact, I think that's probably the easiest thing. It'll just make a mask that blocks and have it not render cubes in those spots because then, then we don't have to change code at all. Something right. that might be nice would be to reuse the, the grid style code and create a simple uh, generator where you just you know have a text file with zeros and ones in a 2D array and then spit out different maps. That might be a quick addition. I think that would be cool. And even just having like a um, an in-game editor where you can just click around. Oh, yeah. It's yeah like a collab better, yeah. video. That could be fun. Yeah, maybe we can do that next week. That might be fun. Let me see if we can uh, figure that out. We can just do like the editor version of it. To take the take the stuff and then put together an editor where you can actually create maps and save out those levels. If you guys are interested in that and want to see that next week, um, hit the like button. If it gets to like two hundred, we'll we'll do that next week. <laughs> uh, to, to, to answer one of the 
Sorry. <laughs> That's one of the questions in chat too. Um, how do you visualize your event firing? As, as Charles said, sometimes it can be a bit of a nightmare when you've got like 50 different events firing. And then as Jason added, it could have events firing events and you can get into spiral loops. How do you solve that kind of a problem? Well, the answer is if all of your events need to be logged, you need to have a way to have a single point of entry to capture incoming events. So my personal suggestion is to have something like an event bus. Effectively, it is a class that will manage the event dispatching. So the idea is everybody else talks to him and says, fire event, fire event, fire event. And he then says, oh, I'm firing an event. And then he actually does the firing event. And the beauty of that is that intermediary section, you have a, a gate for every single event. So you can, a simple version could just simply be to log events as they come in. A more advanced version would be to add multiple different logger types, log the text files or so on. But it's not just logging. It allows you to also say, hang on a second, I'm testing the user. I want all damage events to not fire. So you could put in a filter at that point and stop damage events and maintain the rest of the code while you're running. So having some sort of nexus point where all of your events loop through a single entry point allows you to have a lot more control over the event dispatching of your application. Uh, the caveat to all of that is, as we said earlier, don't fill your application with events. Events mm -hmm. should be there when you need events. They shouldn't be used universally for every single thing that ever gets called in your code. So when something is important enough to be uh, not in a loop as well, it's something that is event driven that happens in your code not too frequently and qualifies as an event, then have some sort of event bus that dispatches it. Would be my, again, my, my personal way of approaching the problem. That's not a bad idea. Have you used some of the um, existing ones out there for Unity, by the way? Yeah, this one is, a, this is a, what is it, Oki or something? I forgot the company name. Uh, Queen's been an O. Uh, they've got a really nice one. It's, it's, uh, it's very low uh, footprint. I know there are a couple out there. It might be interesting to do something on those sometime yeah. just show how to use a couple of them and what the benefits are. Because I think you just gave some really good examples of why you would want to use those too. Mm. Just being able to filter, like that's super nice being able to have all that extra functionality. So it's putting in a filled cube count in our game board. Um, I'll go to it real quick. It's just an integer. It's going to start off at zero. And then in toggle, if we turn them on, so we add one. So if on is true, we add one. If on is false, we add negative one. So it's just going to go up and down. Um, and then it is completely filled Boolean here that just returns back whether or not that count matches our cubes and rows. Since we don't have blockers right now, that should give us the thing. And then I think when we're in here, let's see, in our game controller, we can just check to see when we fill a cube, right, like right here, when we do the filling. Um, here, let's make this a method. Select, select it all and refactor extract. Control shift R, by the way, extract. And we'll pick a new method called select like fill cube. And then if the cubes are full, um, actually, I don't want to do that in here. Let's say like if board, the game board dot is completely filled, um, you win. I don't know how we win. Scene manager dot load level. <laughs> Load scene async zero, or we'll just re restart. Which should be really, really weird because we'll fill it all up and then the game will reload. We could probably play a particle or something. Let's see. Get that, we drag it around and bam, hey. it reloads. And if I can't finish it, okay, it reloads. Yep, cool. Nice. I don't know. It seems like it's working. Yeah, it looks great. And just imagine you had a sound generator for every time you, you select the new grid square. It does a nice little ping sound for each one. That'd be quite nice. Yeah. <laughs> and we could do that. So we could now people asking about events, like we could add like a, a sound controller and just make a script like this is this is the nice thing about events right and the reason that they become really really fun when you figure out how to use them so we just do like a start and do like was it a game board or where, where do we set it we do it in our game controller we set the board um we could just set it on our sound controller let me see game controller i it's, it's tiny and it's still <laughs> so we could um yeah we you know, just well, you could just make this a singleton i, I know it's uh the evil anti-pattern but the game controller there's going to be one game running right at least in this implementation so 
I, I wouldn't be opposed in this particular instance for using oh, it. Making it a, a single ten and just get yeah. it. But the problem is I, I want to, I want to set this game board every time. Well, let's see. How should we set this? I, I was thinking now, like maybe it should like the sound thing should just subscribe on the view. This is where it gets complicated. Because <laughs> <Like, laughs> like the sound, I don't know. I don't know if it should know about the game controller at all. Or if it should just like bind to updates happening in the view. Um or if I could just should just bind the game board to it and when the thing changes, do something. Um, but I think I, 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 it feels more like this thing should be looking at the view. I don't know. Kind of curious what you guys think. I think um, that sounds like an idea for another, another stream. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I think if, if I was to the simple version I would do is I would have the sound controller be the singleton. I would have a method just called play sound. It would take in an audio clip. I would use that inside of the game controller, uh, and then later on, when I'd go to dispatch, to, I'd go to and um, kind of tidy up the code a little bit and refactor it. I would then make a game controller audio script that it would defer to instead, which would then call the sound designer, and it would decouple the two. But for now, literally just having a singleton sound controller uh, with a single play sound function that takes an audio clip kind of allows you to have the sound system have know nothing about the game but the game know about sound and i think that's a that's an okay relationship in terms of how our class is connected currently that seems good um uh, don't forget make it play one shot because you're going to end up hitting issues if you if you don't what was that i, I was like make it play one shot and then pass in the audio clip inside of the play sound function good idea Okay, so we'll go just like that. We'll make an audio clip and we'll make that. Oops, I didn't do my serialized field, my S field. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd be passing in that as an argument in the play sound. So the sound controller can play any sounds, but the game controller chooses a sound and passes it to the sound controller. Oh, I see. But then I got to change my sounds on there. Oh, okay. You could also take in a string or some kind of key reference to reference what kind of sound you want. Well, I'm only going to play one sound. <laughs> I was just going to play a beep um, just because we got like five <laughs> minutes to go. Okay, that's fair, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right, like, play, play anything because uh, yeah, in about five minutes, I don't have somebody at my door. So if we went into here and you're saying, we, I guess we could just do it right here in Phil Q when we call it. So Less than ideal, but did you like sound controller that plays sound? And we make a field for it. I'll just cache it for now instead of making a singleton so it matches everything. But that should, here, get all that extra, oops, all that extra junk. And then we go back over one more time, it should work. We should have some sound and some. Be oh wait, we don't actually have a sound file though. Um, <laughs> beep. Let's search for a beep in the asset store. Free beep. Um, oh, that's right. Is it gonna work? Come on, asset store window. What the heck? I didn't know you could search. On the yeah, there's this store. asset store thing in there, and it just finds files, and you can preview what? the images and stuff. It's really nice. Uh, I had problems with it somewhat recently, but it seems like it's back up and working. Is that new? I, mean, I had problems in the beta. And... No, no, that's been there since five. That's really old. Yeah. Wow. It's, it, I haven't used it until very recently, though. To be honest, it was never worth using in the past, I found, because the store was so damn slow that it would take forever <laughs> to load. Nowadays, it's, they've managed to make it a good bit faster. Did it pop up somewhere? There we go. So Import. Boys. Uncheck everything. Military radio. Beep dot wave. <laughs> that's pretty there funny. We go. Sweet. All right. So we got our beep, set up the sound controller. We'll add that beep sound effect to it. And hit play. Let's see. 
Oh, there's no audio source on my sound controller. Let's add one. Get you every time. Okay, now we'll play. Um, oh, I have to turn off mute audio. Can you guys hear the beeps? Yep. Perfect. Nice. Oh. I guess that's working. Um, <laughs> just, just again, it drives me nuts. Just put that little pitch wobble in. I can't stand whenever someone has a game where they play identical sounds repeatedly over and over again. Just it's some perfect. level of a pitch wobble. <laughs> what? No, no, it's good. <laughs> I get it. If Jason's talking about putting in uh, some pitch randomization, we can do that in the sound controller. So you can just do like a audio source dot pitch equals, and you can do like a. We can just add a little bit of variation there, and then we come back in, and it'll sound not exactly the same every time. It's one of those subtle things that you don't notice um, until you know what you're actually doing. It's one of the reasons Jason points it out all the time. Oh God. That's probably too much of a <laughs> maybe a bit too much, yeah. But you get the idea, all right? You just give it a little variation, and the amount you need to vary depends a lot on the type of sound. Anyway, um, yeah, if you guys want to see the editor part of this, um, let me know. I think we'll try to shoot for doing it early next week, or maybe even later this week. I don't know how time time works out. Just make sure you hit like and share the video though, so that um, we know to do it. That people are actually interested in seeing that stuff. How to build out a level editor. Um, and then maybe some level progression and stuff and go through the whole process and then turn it also into a nicely edited step-by-step -step video afterwards. But hopefully you guys are having fun with it. I had fun. Um, I don't know if you guys want to say anything else. Go subscribe to Charles' channel. Jason, mm -hmm. did you ever make a YouTube channel yet? No, no. People keep telling me I should make some kind of YouTube channel. I haven't gotten around to it yet. Eventually he'll make one. He just one feeds me subscribe. content. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Charles has lots of great stuff. Um, go check out his channel, Infallible Code. Uh, it'll be linked in the description. Um, yeah, if anybody does have any questions or wants to talk to me about anything, um, I kind of live in both discords, so you can catch me. I go buy a piece of fruit. So that's me hovering around in both of the discords. Cool. Yep. And if you guys have other questions, just um, yep, drop them in the comments below. Remember, share and like the videos and all that stuff. And um, yeah, I guess we'll see you in a couple days. Yeah, hopefully. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you guys. All right.